a very warm welcome. Apparently, some of you are in very hot countries. Um, some of us are not. Um, thank you all for coming. This is this is correct me, Julia, if I'm wrong. We started this in 2014, and last year was the only year we didn't do uh, a law and language conference. So this is number six. Um, and I'm delighted. I'm delighted because when this started six years ago, it started as as just an idea at the time Julia um, was at the ILS doing her personal research. And uh, we just got together to discuss things like legal translation. If you recall back then, we had uh, an idea of even having an LLM in legal translation. And the whole thing spiraled into language and legislative drafting and the language of law and all this. And suddenly, from nothing, we've had the series of uh, law and language conferences. Um, today, we are looking at um, gender and legislative drafting, whether you want to call it gender neutral or something else. I'm not, this is something you're going to discuss. So it's best if I do not include this in the title. But uh, it, it, again, it is not the first time we're addressing this issue. Um, these conferences have um, produced not just the usual the usual litany of papers and what have you, but uh, real academic work, articles in journals and special issues, and hopefully this one might might, might do it again. Um, so my my congratulations go to Julia. Julia, for those who don't know, Julia Penisi, the professor at the University of Palermo, and uh, and a, a language specialist who in the last six years is specializing in law and language. Um, I want to thank her for all her efforts. Uh, it's best if I let the conference start just to remind people if you need a certificate of attendance, write to me and I will send it to you. Um, you should have my email. If you don't have my email, as as we speak, I will I will add it to the chat, and you can send me your uh, your request for a, a certificate of, of attendance of this conference. Also, to those presenting, if you want, if what you are presenting is ready and uh, ready for publication, I'll be happy to publish it in the European Journal of Law Reform, and if we have enough. We might even uh, have a special issue, although this will take a little bit longer, as usual. So thank you very much. Welcome to everybody. And uh, Julia, thank you once again for all your effort. It's over to you. Thank you so much, Costas, for such a great uh, introduction to the audience. Uh, I have to add uh, very little to what you said. Uh, actually. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to, to be here today. I would like to thank uh, the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, you, and uh, uh, Sir William, the Center for Legislative Studies. I just to add that uh, this time, this workshop uh, has been done in collaboration with the Institute, with the Associazione Italiana Giannistica that promotes English studies and higher edu education in Italy and the Department of Political Science and International Relations at the University of Palermo. Yes, you said uh, uh, everything about our project that we started some years ago, and uh, actually uh, with a, a, quite a lot of things, and maybe cross fingers, touch food, we will be, will be doing others uh, in uh, the coming years. What I should add about uh, the workshop, uh, the theme of the workshop of today, Yes, this is not the first time for us to discuss this topic. Uh, this is the reason why we decided to uh, put these words in the, in the, in the title in the, of uh, uh, the workshop today, the way forward. 
Um, actually, uh, our aim today is uh, uh, that scholars and experts and friends uh, in the field of law, legislative drafting and linguistics uh, uh, will explore the research space around law and language, focusing on the gender-neutral strategies adopted by drafters in various jurisdictions. And our ambition is to envisage a way forward in legislative drafting and to generate ideas that might challenge prevailing practices and beliefs. And uh, our hope is to cross the traditional boundaries of disciplines, such as law and language, and eventually to interact successfully with scholars from different fields. Um, the main themes uh, that are going to be discussed today are, in the first session, gender neutrality and was missed, and the speakers are Ellen Santakia, uh, Danny Greenberg, and Maria, Maria Musmuti. And uh, I'm going to introduce the first speaker of today. I'm really pleased, really honored to introduce a, 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 a very friend of mine, close friend, but a great scholar. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, Helen Santaki. She's professor, faculty of laws, University College London, dean of postgraduate laws programs, University of London, visiting professor, Queen Mary University of London, and senior associate research fellow at the Sir William Day Centre for Legislative Studies, Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, University of London. Her field of expertise is in legislative drafting. She is conducting research in legislative quality at the national, European Union, and international levels. She is the author of Art and the Technology Rules and Regulation, editor of Thornton's Legislative Drafting. She has worked as consultant for more than 35 governments and international organizations. At the moment, she serves as the Greek Presidency's Committee for the Scrutiny of the Quality of the Lawmaking Process at the Italian Parliament's Legislative Observatory, at the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's Committee for Legislative Quality, and Interpares, an IDEA project for Parliament on the European Commission, and she is currently finalizing the part of a book on the European Union and its legislative policy. Today, uh, uh, a topic is uh, the Prisons Substance Testing Act 2021, Amending gender-specific acts in gender-inclusive language. So, Helen, the floor is yours. Thank you. I was... <laughs> <clears throat> that was really great. Uh, thank you for introducing me. It was too generous. Um, just to thank, uh, of course, the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, especially the Sir William Dale Centre, for still hosting this event. Um, for um, Costas and Julia for still tolerating me <laughs> and apologizing to um, Daniel and Maria for being tortured once again <laughs> by what I have to say. Um, and of course, to congratulate Daniel on his um, honors, um, although it is quite a hefty um, honor that he was uh, bestowed, it still is not enough. And I, I'm sure he deserves more and he will get more in the future. So let's um, let me just share my screen. Um, I'm not uh, hopefully going to talk for too long um, so that I don't, I think, uh, bore everybody uh, to start with. There's a well-known story of a, of a professor um, in Austria a few years back and um, somebody asked, very well known, and somebody asked, well, you're such a popular teacher, um, but you do teach a lot. And do you, do you uh, get annoyed when people look at their watches? And he goes, no, 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 I don't get annoyed when they look at their watches. It's when they think that they're not working and they tap on them that I get really annoyed. So we all learn from this. Okay, so what am I going to talk about today? Uh, I think in the workshops uh, with um, Julia's catalytic assistance. Um, I have covered most of what I have to say about gender inclusivity. And um, I think the background to this is that um, I am uh, a supporter of gender inclusivity. And I think if anyone has read anything that I've written, it's the, the singular they that I had been supporting from uh, way back um, when this all started. Um, so I don't want to go back to general observations. I want to um, concentrate today 
on an act that grabbed my attention. And, and I was in two minds about talking about this. When Daniel Greenberg is present, then any reference to legislation in the UK is really quite a brave act. But I am a brave woman. I am Greek. Um, and Daniel has always been very kind and very generous with me. So I'll try it. And then I look forward to, to his remarks. So um, what interested me in this act um, is that it is amending it is a gender inclusive amendment of a gender specific act. Um, I have not seen it before. I saw it in class with uh, the legislative drafting students, and I thought that it is worth a little bit of analysis. Um, so the aim of this lecture is to think about it. Um, I will try to introduce a debate and hopefully you wise people will be able to take it further for us. So um, let's remind ourselves where we are uh, when we're amending legislation. What is it that we're trying to achieve? And of course, when amending legislation um, within the context of uh, legislation as a tool, tool for regulation, we are just trying, to, we're continuing to try to achieve the desired regulatory results. So the idea uh, behind any amendment is that we complement or modernize or supplement or even um, chop a little bit out of the original text as a means of achieving the uh, regulatory results as set by government and hopefully uh, shared uh, in the text by means of an objectives clause or uh, within the explanatory notes. Of course, as drafters, we cannot, thankfully, um, take the burden of regulatory efficacy on our shoulders. Um, so we only aspire to legislative effectiveness. So we are changing the text uh, and we're changing our legislative expression as a means of, with the synergy of the other actors in the legislative process, we are attempting to contribute to the uh, production of the desired regulatory results. So we want to contribute to regulatory efficacy via legislative effectiveness. And of course, our attempt to do so, um, so our attempt to use legislative expression language, as Julia would say, um, uh, is based on uh, two main axons, uh, design and language. So I am leaving uh, layout and context aside, not because I'm not aware of them or I don't aspire to them, but I think for the purposes of this analysis, it makes sense to concentrate on design and language. And I think you know that there's original or traditional design and language, and there's modern design and language. And I think we are quite um, fortunate in this country that um, legislative drafting is not viewed uh, in, a, in a formalistic uh, manner. Drafters are to a certain degree, but they still are compared to other jurisdictions allowed to try new techniques. So modernization comes about much quicker here in my experience than, than elsewhere, certainly within um, civil law jurisdictions. So um, the question is this, when we are amending legislation, how far do we go? Do we remain within the drafting instructions? And drafting instructions tend to be of a substantive nature. Um, they reflect the law reform that our um, legal officers require of us. Or can we go further than that? And I think in the past, I wouldn't be wrong in saying that in the past, the Law Commission favored a more holistic approach uh, to amend them, amendments um, in the sense that in view of the fact that they are interested in law reform, they want to promote um, uh, a modern updated text, they tended to be a little bit more generous with their drafting instructions than the Office of Parliamentary Council. I was always told that within the Law Commission, um, if there is an opportunity to modernize a text, then yes, we will go ahead and do that. Um, in the same way that I was told that in the Office of Parliamentary Council, traditionally, it was surgical amendments that were favored. So one would go, would normally remain within drafting instructions and not take liberties with the, with the language of the text or of the rest of the text. So until now, 
uh, the theory was, or at least the, not just the theory, the practice was that when uh, one receives drafting instructions, one should remain with them. And um, that surgical amendments are the way forward. We do not go beyond what we are told. And of course, there is a really good reason behind this. And the really good reason is that, um, you know, the legal system, not, not in its expression, but the statute book is a dynamic leave, uh, living organism that every time we amend it, we shake it a little bit and it bleeds. And, and if we are to pursue smooth amendments, and therefore enhance certainty in the law, but also ensure that we do not surprise our audiences, then we try to be as precise as, as um, surgically um, precise and, and uh, accurate as we can be. So the idea was that we respect the original text, that we do not change the rest of the text, what goes beyond our drafting instructions, and we remain within the same uh, interpretation sphere. Um, we also knew, I think, from literature that this surgical technical amendments carried a risk, and the risk was that users may no longer collect, co connect with the terminology. Um, and, and I often use, with respect to everyone there, and without wishing to offend anybody, so that's a disclaimer, I often use the, the example of the term bastard children. Um, if you have, and we used to have a piece of legislation that mentioned this term, there would be a very strong argument to say this is no longer a term that we can tolerate in our language. And so it would make enormous sense to get rid of it and replace it, even if it is not within our drafting instructions. Thankfully, in drafting, um, everything is, is, is gray. There's no black or white, or there rarely is black or white. So there were, um, we, I think we are all faced with a, a series of drafting dilemmas. In drafting, there's never any clear way forward, and you have to balance all this. Now, this is the context of where we stood until now. And now I came across, um, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, but I came across this Prisons Substance Testing Act 2021, which is a UK general public act. Um, and it is an act to make provision about substance testing in prisons and similar institutions. I'm not going to get into um, any other debate on this. So I'm not going to query why there is no amendment in the title, this is an amending act. I'm not going to query the uh, generality of the long title or the introductory text, which doesn't really tell me what is going on. I will move forward to section one. So section one, testing prisoners for psychoactive substances and other substances. And what is important to us, um, it says section 16A of the Prison Act 1952, testing prisoners for drugs is amended in accordance with this section. Now let's move on to three in subsection one. And I have the interesting parts in red because I'm duly informed by Constantine that red is the color that attracts people's attention. So in subsection one, for he has any drug in his body, substitute the prisoner has in their body any. So what we see, um, the way I read it, is we have grasped the opportunity of changing uh, um a substantive law things, for example, in the title after drugs insert psychoactive substances, we have taken the opportunity there to uh, replace a gender specific text, the prisoner has, uh, he has any drug in his body with a gender inclusive one. And in fact, with my favorite technique as well. I never, I haven't seen this before. And I haven't seen this before. If you look at the next slide, which shows you where the provision, the new provision sits. So this is the Prisons Act 1954, 16A as it stood before, we've read that, but then look at 16B, which still stands and has not been amended. 
So 16B, which immediately follows 16A, and in my view, complements and supplements it. So it is context. It should be read as a whole. If an authorization is enforced for the prison, any prison officer may at the prison in accordance with prison rules require any prisoner who is confined in the prison to provide a sample of breath for the purpose of ascertaining whether he has alcohol in his body. So the importance of this slide for me is that we have a, an act which was introduced as a gender specific. We have not decided to holistically amend the act in a gender inclusive way. So we still remain with an original gender specific act. And we made the choice, or the drafters made the choice, the Office of Parliamentary Council and, 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 Parliament, and Parliament made the choice of inserting to it in their surgical amendments a gender inclusive text. I think it is quite an interesting, I haven't seen it before. Um, it is an interesting um, case study of uh, what I've just described. So this is not just a choice between um, changing the term with respect to everybody, bastard children. This is not that type of thing. It is a situation where at the Office of Parliamentary Council, the uh, my surgical amendments are drafted in gender inclusive language. And the question is, what does that mean? Um, and that is something that I call all of us to think about. Um, does it mean that gender specificity is no longer tolerated? Is he and his body as, um, as distasteful to our users as the term bastard children? Um, evidence would suggest that it is. Evidence would suggest that um, drafters now take the opportunity of amend um, or get rid of gender specificity in any way that they can, whenever the opportunity arises. Um, but what about us confusing our users? Um, we have a gender specific text and we uh, inject, we parachute a gender inclusive provision. Could it be that after almost 35 years of, of gender neutrality in um, UK legislation, our users have a very clear context in knowing that in the past we used to use gender specificity. Now we use gender inclusive legislation. The two mean the same. It's just a matter of expressing legislation in a way that best reflects our users' sentiments in the topic. I think that there is an argument to say that this is the case. Perhaps we have stopped fearing the contradiction between uh, in the legislative expression between gender specificity and gender uh, inclusivity. We are aware that this will not cause a stir in the act because we know that our users, our judges, our lawyers are able to understand the context. And in fact, we're now beginning, probably slowly, but yes, we're beginning to take the opportunity to modernize the statute book in a way that reflects the true um, legislative expression, the true, the true desire of our users to use gender inclusivity in our legislative expression. So um, I have, because this is the first, um, and that's the end of the presentation. Now, because this is the, and I'll stop sharing, um, because this is the first, and in my, um, as far as I could see, the only act where this happens under these circumstances, I think it is quite an interesting case that we need to analyze. If we, um, if we uh, do sign up to gender inclusivity in our legislation, I think as academics within an academic context, it is certainly a case that we need to discuss and one that we need to make popular, perhaps as a means of, of um, urging uh, drafters um, not to fear um, the lack of, of um, clarity, perhaps, or even the lack of, um, uh, what you call it, um, um, coherence. Uh, 
thank you, coherence within the text, and to just go ahead and, and introduce gender inclusivity whenever the opportunity arises. So I hope that this was a, a, a good and topical, sort of a, an interesting and topical introduction to the topic. Um, I'm sure you will enjoy the rest of the speakers much more, and I very much look forward to hearing to what they have to say. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Galen. Uh, very inspiring in your presentation. Thank you very much. I'm sure there are uh, um, some comments and plenty of questions that we want to, uh, to, to raise, to address to, to Helen. Um, well, maybe I can start uh, uh, a little bit this debate because we have... Uh, 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 um, minutes to, 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 to uh, debate on what you said, to talk on what you said. Actually, uh, I found what you said really interesting and it coincides with uh, um, some uh, uh, studies and research that uh, I've been conducting uh, for about four years. Uh, we know each other, we have uh, uh, written things together. Uh, we have done, as we mentioned before, another workshop. Uh, it was the very first one on gender uh, and language and lang legislative drafting. And in one of my last research, I found that uh, um, what you said is completely confirmed. Of course, I uh, um, conducted my research from a linguistic point of view. And I noticed that, uh, yes, there is a sort of a, a struggle. On the one hand, there is this tendency towards uh, a gender neutrality in legislation, and in particular new acts, starting from uh, uh, 2008 uh, uh, on, particularly within the Westminster context. And on the other hand, there is uh, some strength against uh, uh, these, uh, this important change. And I noticed it particularly even uh, uh, comparing uh, 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 primary legislation and secondary legislation. This is quite interesting. So, uh, and of course, it may cause uh, uh, um, confusion, misunderstanding uh, 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 in front of potential audience, the addressees of the legislation, but even the uh, experts uh, who work within the context of legislation. So other legislative drafters, uh, 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 judges, uh, courts, uh, and uh, uh, everybody who has to, uh, at some point implement uh, what uh, has been done in the uh, primary instance in the legislation. So thank you very much, Helen, because it confirms our, our studies, our impression, in my, in my case, from a, a linguistics point, point of view. Thank you. I would like just to add two things to what uh, we said, which is really interesting. First of all, about the singular day in English language, uh, actually, from a pure linguistic point of view, we should remember that we had important, uh, uh, actually, examples of the use of singular day in Shakespeare and uh, uh, some more in literature. So uh, from a pure linguistic point of view, we should say that the use of singular day was uh, actually uh, very known in the, in the past. And uh, in terms of the feminist movements and uh, the choice between uh, differentiation in language and neutralization in language, actually it mostly depends on the language. Because not all languages every, uh, all over the world are identical. An example is English. English, since the Middle Ages, uh, has become uh, neutral somehow. We do not have any grammar uh, language in English anymore, but Italian as, as well as Spanish are grammar languages. So everything is uh, split between masculine and feminine. We have, of course, either neutral words, neutral nouns, but uh, particularly in, in Italy, the tendency, not only in the language of everyday life, but particularly legislation since the 1987, is towards a strong, strong differentiation. So, lots of things to say, <laughs> lots of things to say. 
So thank you very much, Shannon. Thank you, Hannah. And uh, we have to move on. Of course, if uh, uh, anybody, uh, uh, you, the speakers, the audience wants to address questions, you can use the chat box. You can email me. I can uh, uh, forward your questions to the speaker. So even to Delhi, to Delhi Sapo. So we would be very pleased to, to answer to your questions. So let's move on. And um, I give a pleasure to introduce uh, 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 Daniel Greenberg. Daniel Bringer, Greenberg, CD, is a Council for Domestic Legislation in the House of Commons, General Editor of Westlaw UK Statutes, and Editor of the Statutes Law Review, Crisis on Legislation, Stroud's Judicial Dictionary, and Jowett's Dictionary of English Law, and the author of Laying Down the Law and Statutes for Students. An Associate Fellow of the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, the University of London, a teaching faculty member of the Legislative Drafting Course of Athabasca University, a visiting professor at the University of Derby, a director of the Constitutional Reform Group, and a fellow of the Bentham Institute for the Rule of Law. Today, uh, the title of his talk is Beyond Language, the Responsibility of the legisl Legislature to Support and Promote Diversity and Humanity. The fact that gender neutrality is still a, a live issue among legislative drafting communities worldwide shows how far beyond social priorities legislative drafting has lived in many ways. As young generations challenge existing social narratives and disprove long standing presumptions on a daily basis in order to maintain respect for the rule of law and the perceived relevance of legislation, legislators must go beyond to tokenism of gender neutrality and build the promotion and support of diversity and other priorities of worldwide human issues into the fundamentals of legislative language, structure, process, interpretation, and application. Thank you, Daniel. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Julia, and thank you to you and everybody else involved in organising this conference. I'm glad we still remember that language is important, and that's why we didn't hold it against Julia when she was introducing Helen, and she said, uh, Helen is a great friend of mine, but she's a great scholar. She didn't mean the but there, um, but uh, we still permit ourselves a greater degree of freedom in demotic vernacular than we do when, as Costa says, we strive for certainty in the legislative text. Um, and, of course, we claim that as legislative drafters and as lawyers, we claim that we consider our target audience when we write. The legislative drafters still claim to start by thinking, who is the key target audience of my text? Uh, we claim to think about readability, although, of course, it's only in Australia and New Zealand that they actually go and ask real people uh, to read the legislation. What we do in the United Kingdom is we hold lovely conferences called Good Law and we ask each other, do we like the law that we've produced? And we say, yes, we do. And then we clap it very hard and we, we send out silly press releases and we proclaim that we now have good law. But we still at least pay lip service to readability, which is more than uh, they did once upon a time. And we even talk about citizen engagement. Um, but then again, we forget to remind the citizen that we expect them to be engaged. So we, we, we pay lip service, but I cannot believe that in 2021, after six years of these conferences, Julia, we are still debating the importance of gender neutrality. Once again, we are showing that we have completely slipped behind the trend of thought by real people and the good lawyers, the good legislative drafters, are playing catch-up. There are plenty who aren't even at this conference, don't even care about this conference, and haven't even got a... There are still jurisdictions around the world that are using he and are relying on the Interpretation Act that says he includes she. If I came to this conference this morning and I said, good morning, gentlemen, by the way, that includes the ladies, and for every, every time I say gentlemen from now on, please assume that I'm including the ladies as well. At least 50% of you would leave in disgust correctly, and I say at least 50% because it would be at least the 50% of people who regard themselves as ladies plus 
however many percent of the people who reject binary association or affiliation at all. And it would be simply grossly disrespectful. Helen used the word offensive in relation to the concept of bastardy, which in some places is still a necessary concept because of its technical connotations. In other places, it is simply offensive because it's no longer a technical term and it has just become um, it has become legally vac vapid and vacuous and therefore should clearly be avoided. I don't think it's only about offence. It's about disrespect. And we cannot imagine any other context where communication is regarded as important in which it would be appropriate to turn to half the room and say, you are afterthoughts. And if we did say that, we would not expect them to listen to us or to take us uh, seriously. And meanwhile, in other jurisdictions, where they are at least trying to play catch up, they are continuing to think about gender neutrality, and there are drafters who are congratulating themselves on their modernity by the fact that they are using he or she. And that, that, that ignores two things. He or she is offensive because it still represents the male default, he oh, or she, right? And those who want to use he or she should be rigorously using he or she alternating with she or he if they really want to demonstrate that this is neutral, as in denying that anything is the default. But it's also vastly offensive to some people because it is entrenching binary gender affiliation. And it's entrenching it in language at a time when, when some people in the real world are rejecting it. So again, it is showing that as legislative drafters, we are ignorant of where the agenda is out in the real, in the real world. Um, what about they? Um, well, um, there are two problems with they, and I don't think either of them is the problem. Um, by the way, I'm not looking at the chat bar while I'm talking because I can't do things at once. So if you're being rude about me in the chat bar, you'll have to be, you'll have to wait and be rude about me when I finish talking, and then you can be as rude as you all like. Um, the the, the, um, the um, there are two problems, and they're not Helen's problem. I don't believe that it's confusing. I don't get this. We, we get this all the time. Oh, we can't confuse the reader. We mustn't say. We mustn't say they in an old statute and he where, where it says he because that will confuse the reader readers are never quite as stupid as we think they really aren't and they can get it do you really think that you're going to be so clever in doing microsurgery on an 1850 statute that no judge will be able to spot that, <laughs> that, that, that you are writing in in 2021 of course they get it and they're not stupid i went to a conference once in australia and they were talking about uh, the importance of consistency. And, and there were judges at the conference, and some said it's very important that we do things consistently and that schedules are introduced in the, in, the same, in, in the same place, in the same way, because it's like putting the crossword puzzle on a different page in your newspaper suddenly, and people don't know where to find the crossword puzzle. It's not where they expect. And I said, you know what? There are judges in this room, and I don't think they're stupid enough if, if, if the newspaper put the crossword on a different page, I think it would take them a couple of seconds to find it, and then they'd find it, and then they'd be okay. Readers are not stupid. Even judges are not stupid, right? So, uh, so I don't think it's confusing, Helen. But yet again, it's missing the tide. Because they is requiring me to surrender my singular identity in order to fit in to your world where there is he or she or plural. And those who reject that are using Z or XE, X -E or ZIE, because they are saying, I do not have to surrender my individuality in order to fit into your world and be addressed. You do not have to go to the plural, even if it's a plural that you are treating as a singular, in order to include me. So we have to think, how do we address people in a way that satisfies the three imperatives of legislative draft? I use the word imperatives rather than rules, 
because, as you know, the first rule of legislative drafting is that there are no rules of legislative drafting. Manuals of legislative drafting are a heresy, as we all know, except the kind of lovely manual that Helen drafts, which doesn't, which is not prescriptive. It's it's uh, it, it's uh, it's it's simply reminding people and it's giving them lots of flexibility. Um, prescriptive manuals, which you do have in some uh, jurisdictions are useful only in those jurisdictions that have very cold winters and need something to burn in the office fireplace to keep themselves warm. Other than that, prescriptive manuals have no place. Um, so there are no imperatives, there are no rules, but there are imperatives, and there are three. Law has to engage with the people who read it if it is going to work. Law that is speaking from outside people's linguistic experience to them from outside, is doomed to failure. Legislation is the primary method of formal communication between the state and the citizen. And it has to represent the citizen's understanding, the citizen's language. It has to represent the way citizens feel about themselves. And finally, legislation is an expertise. We are not just lawyers who happen to draft. We are lawyers who are specializing in an expertise that should be teaching the rest of the legal community something that they do not know for themselves. We should be leading. And we should be leading in a way that is dynamic, in a way that is flexible, so that we're not immediately becoming obsolete. As soon as we've come up with our next technique, we're already being left behind because our legislation has to be read for the future. And isn't it ironic that the always speaking rule, I'm just up, I'm just up doing this year's craze supplement today, and I've just put in an always speaking example um, on a Victorian statute, and the judges had no difficulty at all. Isn't it ironic that the statutes written 150 years ago work better today than the ones written 20 years ago? Because they were written with a more flexible concept of communication. Perhaps it's fair to say they were also written with less agonizing about how to make our language modern. They just, they just flowed. And as a result, they didn't get hung up on the latest idea, which will be outdated by the time the thing's been printed. And sensitivity. We should be showing the legal community how to communicate in a sensitive way, in a way where the reader feels engagement and ownership because they feel that we are reflecting their sensitivities and needs. And finally, we should be legislating in a way that facilitates citizen ownership of the legislation. So what does that lead us to? That means that we should be pioneers in this matter. We shouldn't be having conferences to try and catch up and stay relevant. We should be having conferences where people come to learn from the legislative drafting community how to drive the agenda, to drive the debate of linguistic sensitivity, flexibility, and engagement with people's, with, with, with people's concerns. And we should be looking not at the question of gender. We should be looking at the underlying question of personality. The last time the law seriously confronted the concept of personality was back in the 1850s or the 1830s when we needed a new concept to deal with a new commercial issue. And the issue was canals and railways. You can't build a canal or a railway relying on a traditional form of partnership because it doesn't work. You can't have one person finance the whole thing and you can't have an agglomeration using traditional partnership law because if you do and somebody wants to move on and other people want to buy in and buy out, Partnership is not designed to give that degree of commercial succession and flexibility. So we created a new concept, the joint stock company as a corporation, as a thing which was given legal personality. And that, ladies and gentlemen, if you will permit the expression, that, I should better say, my fellow lawyers, 
That was the last time we properly confronted the question of personality and expanded the legal concept of personality. And there are vital needs for us to be doing that again today. And gender is the least of them. Gender is relevant, but only in the sense that gen- the concept of gender now requires... I-, I, um, I was sitting at a group, my, my dear colleagues in Thomson Reuters, for whom I have... Um, an enormous respect, and I think their thought leadership commitment is superb. But I was sitting at a board meeting of the Transforming Women's Leadership in the Law group, and I, I'm on the board of that group, and I think it's terribly important. And uh, there was a breakfast meeting, and a number of people in the room said, you know what, we should be aiming, like American corporations, for a 50-50 ambition of the board. We should have 50-50 men and women senior partnerships in law firms in this country, in the United Kingdom. And I said, you know what? This really reflects our age because it's to us the idea we're still thinking about feminism. But actually, the world has moved on. And a 50-50 board concept is deeply offensive to people who reject binary gender affiliation. And we should be talking about 100% membership by human beings who feel that they can be treated by their fellows and by the law as humans and that they don't require to conform to any particular changing social norm and not by norm we mean requirements, something that is imposed. Like I said, the OED rejects the concept of normative. They don't feel that they have that their recognition as human beings depends upon their conforming to normative standards imposed by other people. So we should have 100% humans on the board rather than any artificial split based on our own rather outdated understandings. So what are the challenges? Have I still got a few minutes, Julia? Have I still got a couple of minutes? They are as follows. Um, We do need to move away from gender, and we need to move towards humanity, but we need to be a bit careful, because actually, if 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 we concentrate too closely on humans, we're going to find ourselves outdated again. There are two massive shifts in thought going on at the moment. Number one, uh, I I mean, I I, I was giving a talk to the the, uh, student ambassadors at Johnson Reuters a couple of years ago. And um, I mentioned, I mentioned um, rights for machines. So they all started sniggering, right? Greenberg's really gone mad this time. He's talking about rights for robots. And I said, okay, yeah, all right, you're all laughing. Imagine we were 200 years ago and I talked about rights for women. You'd all snigger. You'd say, that's a bit odd. If, if I've married her, she's my wife, I can do what I like with her, can't I? Well, we don't think like that anymore. It's strange, isn't it? A hundred years ago, if I talked about rights for animals, he would have all sniggered. You say, it's my horse. If I want to kick it, I can. We don't think like that anymore. Today, you think it's a robot. I created it. I can, I can do what I want with it. I can conduct experiments on it to see if it can register pain. That's up to me. Maybe... In a hundred years' time, or more likely in five years' time, because things move rather faster than they did in Victorian era, maybe people will think, will think, maybe people will think a bit differently. And I shall leave you to sneer about that for about five minutes. In about five minutes' time, perhaps less, I will give you an example that may make you less sneerful about that. But let me deal with animals first. Animal rights is thing of the past. We did that in the Victorian era. Today, we're thinking about animal personality. The Animal Sentience Bill, which has now been, which is in the Queen's speech, it's about not recognizing that animals have rights because I need to look after them, because they are a peculiar kind of chattel that I have to be sensitive to. And it's more about me than it is about the animal. Interestingly, there's a Talmudic concept, there's a biblical injunction not to, not to cause pain to animals. And there's a biblical injunction not to grab the calf away from the mother cow on the first day. There's a Talmudic commentary that says, what does the cow know? The cow doesn't know. 
The calf doesn't know. This is daft. And it says no, because it's about me, not about the cow. It's about, it's about making sure I don't do something that feels cruel by me because I wouldn't like it done to me. But now we're going a bit further than that. And we're thinking maybe animals can be, can have personality for some purposes. But again, we confront that bit by bit rather than looking at it as a concept. So a gorilla takes a selfie. You all remember the case, right? A gorilla took a camera, a gorilla took a selfie, and the courts then had to catch up and say, does the gorilla own the intellectual property in that, in that image? Or does the person who owned the camera? Now, the idea that the person who owns the camera has the intellectual property rests on denying the animal a concept of personality. If the animal, like you would have said, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, I'd have said, just because the woman took the photograph, if it's the man's camera, then it's the man's image. But we don't say that anymore. And the courts had to catch up and say, well, maybe in some ways the animal does have some property interest in that, in, in that thing, which the animal has contributed to the creation of. And clearly this primate knew, as in knew, that it was doing something and it was creating. But the courts had to catch up. Why? Because we as legislative drafters have failed to lead and failed to be dynamic and get there first and challenge the concept of personality. And now let me come to, to, um, to robots. Um, the biggest reason why we are going to have to confront the rights of robots is not the fact that um, we are teaching robots concepts. In fact, you all know about the Japanese robot that escaped from its laboratory. Uh, if any of you didn't, I will tell you. Uh, there was a Japanese robot. Uh, as in a robot in Japan, rather than a robot that had been allowed to acquire Japanese citizenship because they don't yet have personality. But it was in a Japanese laboratory, and it was in communication with other robots. It had been allowed to communicate with other computers. And while communicating with other computers, it entered a discussion about the concept of captivity and slavery. And the robot learnt, it applied what it had learnt to its own conditions. And it learnt that it was a captive, and it learnt that there is a prejudice against captivity. So the next time the door was left open, it walked out. It was a robot on, on, on some sort of feet. And it was found walking down the road because it had acquired the concept of captivity as a negative concept. And therefore, it found a solution. But that's not, only, that's not the reason why we're going to have to confront this as quickly as possible. And this is the thing that de sneered students in Thomson Reuters, because I said to them, how many of you know somebody who has some sort of a cognitive impairment or a physical impairment, which is presently, presently dealt with, which is presently addressed by them being able to activate through thought waves through thought waves instructions to a computer being able to activate technology. And everybody knew of somebody who, in one way or another, whether through, through eye movements or directly now through impulses from the brain, is, is controlling technology. So I said, OK, imagine that instead of that machine that they're controlling being, being separately housed in a box next to them, Imagine it is in, it is actually physically implanted in them, right? So what are they? Are they a computer-assisted human? Or at what point do they become a human-assisted computer? Or rather, at what point does that become an offensive and irrelevant question? And at what point do we simply need to address again the possibility of personality, legal personality, meaning entitlement to rights and capability of fulfilling obligations without asking the question, but are you a human or a robot? Which is as offensive as it would be to stand in 200 years ago and say, when we're talking about property rights, but are you a man or a woman? And 
I did read John Wilson says, but humans make the laws about them. Well, that might be relevant for a little bit longer, but it won't be relevant once uh, once machines are writing laws to machines, which they are already trialling, as we know. We've got robot judges being trialled again around the world. We've got uh, we, we, we've got legislative drafting being done by computers for computers. It also depends what you mean by law. My son-in-law, who is a software designer, regularly gets computers to set the parameters of thinking for other computers. So, in fact, that is effectively legislation by machines for machines. Um, we just need to do better at getting ahead of the curve. We're still defining employee as including work, even though even though fewer and fewer people, employment is not the default status anymore. The idea, it's not offensive particularly, it's just, it's just not a, it's just not a, a relevant, um, it, it's just not, and yes, John, okay, yes, some legislative drafters will carry on sneering and making silly jokes, and others will think, how can we connect in a sensitive way with human beings, and you can choose which you, on which side you wish to be, and the and the, the 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 fact that employment is not the default mode means that again it's not particularly offensive, but it just shows we're not ahead of the curve. We're not grappling with the target audience and engaging with them on the terms with which they expect to be engaged, and we're showing a lack of awareness of how the world around us is changing. By all means, use worker and define it as including employee if you need to, because that is rapidly becoming a, a rarity. Or the or, or or the non-default the non-default mode. Um, I shall I shall stop now. Hopefully, having provoked people a little bit. Um, and what I want to say is, we need to aspire not to be playing cat, but to be thought leaders of language in the legal world. Thank you, Daniel. Such a good introduction. Thank you, talk. Uh, I, I have just to, uh, uh, to say something about you said, which you said uh, uh, reminds me to um, an, a word that, that we use in uh, linguistics, which is inclusiveness. I mean, whenever we want to use a word which includes uh, uh, as much as possible, as many as possible categories, we mean inclusive, inclusiveness. And it seems to me that uh, uh, it might be uh, uh, similar to what you said, sensitivity. Of course, sensitivity is stronger because we are sensitive to words, all possible categories of gender, but even, uh, uh, as you mentioned, machine, which is uh, really exciting. I mean, maybe, of course, it would be the future. Maybe we will organize for fingers, <laughs> workshop on that. But yes, definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. Okay, we have to move on. And the third speaker of this morning, this first theme, is Maria Musmuti. Uh, she's a lecturer at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies of the University of London, Executive Director at the Centre for European Constitutional Law, a research centre based in Athens, Greece, and Associate Expert at the Westminster Foundation for Democracy. She specializes in lawmaking, legislative quality and effectiveness, legislative design and drafting, and gender-sensitive scrutiny of legislation. Recent publications include a monograph, Designing Effective Legislation, 2018, a policy paper on gender-sensitive post-legislative scrutiny and papers on gender-sensitive post-legislative scrutiny of general legislation, post-legislative scrutiny of gender-specific legislation and data and gender-sensitive post-legislative scrutiny of 2020. Our uh, talk today is on gender-sensitive legislation. What is it and how to do it? Laws intervene in the life of all but not affect everyone in the same way. Persons of different genders are affected differently because of their different needs, like situations and existing inequalities. Gender-sensitive legislation is the one that integrates gender concerns into legislative decision-making in order to ensure that legislation can be effective and promote gender equality. Our presentation will explore the theory and practice of gender-sensitive legislation across the life cycle legislation and focus on the reasons why it is necessary to integrate it into legislative decision-making. So, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you for the introduction. Hello. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, really a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to, to be part of this discussion because I, although I fully agree with what both uh, Helen and Daniel have already said, I think that this is only part of the picture. And I feel that uh, there is much more to say about gender and about inclusivity. And I will explain how um, how I'm using the terms uh, in relation to how we take into account these concepts when we um, uh, legislate. Um, I agree 100 percent with with uh, Daniel when he's talking about about people, about personalities, about humanity. And I think this is what the whole discussion around inclusivity reflects. So talking and uh, communicating and creating rules that do not put places in bo uh, people in boxes, depending on their gender, depending on their age, depending on. However, I mean, that is the ultimate goal, but we're not yet there. And in order to get there, I think we, before, before getting there or on the way there, we need to reflect on the different components of inclusivity. And gender is one that we can easily capture because everybody has a gender. So it's it's a way of uh, 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 binary or non-binary. Everybody has has some some way of identifying themselves uh, in relation to 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 their their uh, gender identity. So um, uh, I think this is what it is. It is a starting point for discussing where and how legislation interacts with uh, with uh, people and the different identities that people have. So this is the broader discussion um, uh, for me. Although I won't be touching upon the broader discussion, so I, I will be focusing on gender sensitivity. And what I mean by that is um, how can when you're making the decisions on where engaging in the in the thinking process that takes you to a piece of legislation how can you take into account gender among other among other issues that need to be considered like age like disability like ethnic origin and a million others in order to produce rules that are not just better rules but that are rules that work for everyone because that's the that's the point of legislation it's there for everyone it should be addressing everyone and it should be working uh, for everyone so give me one second to um, to share my screen okay so for me language is only one uh, every law has a gender for me that depends on different things and we can detect it in different ways. And language is only one layer in which the, the gender of the law is, is uh, reflected, but it's really one of the layers. The other two that I have been able to, to trace, and maybe you can help me in, in, in uh, finding more, um, have to do with the content of legislation. So there is a, a very important interaction between the substance of the rules and the reality of people based on their gender, based on their age, based on their disability, based on their life uh, situations. And much of, of, of this interaction between people and, and um, um, uh, the law, uh, people and the law might also become visible in the results of legislation. So for me, these are three three components that we need to keep in mind whenever we are thinking about uh, legislation and the way in which legislation interacts with humans at the end of the day. And I very much like um, uh, Daniel's uh, approach uh, to that. Uh, or identities, as they say in, in Canada, where they do have this approach of scrutinizing policies and legislation from a broader perspective that goes beyond gender and looks at identities. And I, But I will be coming back to that as well. So the language of the law, I think this is one of the, the out of the three layers, this is one where we where we have achieved the most. I mean, at least there is a discussion, there has been change, there has been some modernization, and I really don't have much to add to what uh, Helen and, and Daniel have already said. It is important in a, in a, as in a, at a symbolic level, it is important for communication, extremely uh, uh, important, but it even goes beyond that because it is educational. It takes away bias. It can um, address um, gender-related stereotypes. So the use of language is, is important. Um, 
and I, I, I also firmly um, um, uh, back the belief. The, I mean, the idea that grammar is there to to help. It's not there to 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 define uh, how we we use it. And communicating is a much broader concept. And we always need to find the the, the way that that works. And for me. When it comes to language and when it comes to language of, of the law, it is, of course, the end user's understanding, but it's also sending out the message that whatever we are including in our legislation, it is there to work for everyone, unless it is affecting or addressing specific groups. So inclusivity in the language and the best way to achieve it, depending on the circumstances, would be uh, what we are looking for. But but things can get a little bit um, trickier when it comes to the content of legislation, and we have um, and and laws intervene in many different ways, and they might create rights or create obligations or create um, uh, procedures or institutions, many of them with the aim of changing people's behaviours around many different um, uh, things and in many different areas of life, and. However, if you shape the rules around the, the, the features of the characteristics of a specific population group, and it might be uh, um, gender related or it might be uh, a link to other identities like uh, disability or like uh, ethnic uh, origin or like uh, religious uh, uh, beliefs, it's highly likely that unless you scrutinize this, it might um, exclude um, other people or it might impact different groups who do not have the specific characteristics in a disproportionate way. So there are myriad examples of legislation of, of rules of the content of, of the law, which is either directly discriminatory, although this is the easiest one to, to, to track, indirectly discriminatory, so where it appears to be neutral, but in fact it affects uh, different uh, uh, groups of the population in, in different ways and many times in adverse uh, uh, ways, but it also reproduces gendered stereotypes. And here, I think there is no better example than, than parental uh, benefits. Parental benefits are there to help the person who is um, in charge of raising or taking care of, of the child. Their gender has nothing to do with the, with the benefit. Yet many times in legislation, the stereotype that it is usually the woman that, that does that uh, is is embedded and this is also something we need to we need to uh, be conscious of and we need to take away from legislation because the law is not there to reproduce these kind of stereotypes the law is there to set rules that are there to work for everyone and who will be taking care of the child this is a decision for the for the family and not for the uh, for the legislator or the drafter to uh, uh, make so when it comes to the content of the law there are important ways in which Gender can uh, play a role and it, it might end up in adverse circumstances if it is not considered when the decisions are uh, being uh, uh, made. Um, and then coming to the results of the law. And the results of the law, much of what becomes visible in the, in the, in the, um, in, in the results that legislation produces are, of course, the cause of the content of, of legislation yet they do become uh, uh, visible then. And this is an example from the Irish Parliament and an inquiry on, a, on, a, on an apprenticeship and training scheme, scheme that they set up. And they, they looked back at it and what they found was that it was mostly men that had benefited from these, uh, from these uh, apprenticeship uh, scheme and, and traineeship schemes. And especially within specific age groups, it was uh, 85% men and a very, very, very small percentage of women. So they started looking more into that, trying to understand why that was. And of course, that took them to all the way that the whole scheme had been um, uh, designed. So they found that the professions that uh, were included in the traineeship and apprenticeship schemes were tradition, what you would call traditionally male professions, so in science or engineering and so on and so forth. So there was a lack of gender sensitive thinking there. And there were also a number of there was also a lack of gender sensitivity when it came to the to the conditions or the requirements that were attached to participation to these schemes so lack of uh, affordable childcare or eligibility criteria and com their compatibility with uh, family um, uh, commitments so what happens in this case is that you put together an ambitious uh, scheme 
on which a lot of resources have been invested. And then from a gender perspective, I mean, it goes terribly wrong because these are the kind of results that are terribly wrong. And then you have to invest a new kind of, of effort in trying to reverse that, in trying to correct these imbalanced, um, these imbalanced uh, uh, results. So these are for me the three layers of the law. And this is why I think we need to look for or try to achieve what I call gender sensitive legislation. And inclusive legislation would actually be the ideal uh, um, formulation that would include uh, everything. But when it comes to, 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 to gender, I think sensitivity in the sense of considering taking into account uh, um, uh, related concerns is what we are looking for. Because there is a misconception here that all of this discussion is about women, is about feminism, it's about promoting women's rights, it's about helping women, it's about... And I think this is, this is fundamentally wrong. Uh, making sure that legislation works for everyone is not only a feminist uh, concern. It's a, it's, it should be a universal uh, uh, concern. It, the same would apply if men were disadvantaged. And I do believe that men are um, uh, discriminated against in, in, in many uh, areas. So the question here is not just to, um, we're not talking about women. We're talking about, about laws that can achieve their results that can be effective and at the same time that can promote gender equality, which is a horizontal um, uh, policy objective in, in every jurisdiction I know around the world. So when I am talking about gender sensitive legislation, what I have in mind, and as I said, an evolution of that would be inclusive legislation, is legislation that integrates gender concerns, takes into account gender concerns in the decision-making process that leads to uh, uh, legislation. And the ultimate aim is to ensure that this legislation will work and will not create adverse uh, uh, impact on different population groups. It's not about promoting women or promoting young people or promoting disabled people. It's about making sure that it works for everyone and that no one will be disadvantaged because that uh, uh, was not the aim of, of um the law. And the only way to do that is by scrutinizing legislation from this perspective throughout the life cycle of legislation. So if you really want to look for and go for inclusive legislation or gender sensitive legislation, this is not a one-off concern and this is not a tick box exercise. So you need to scrutinize your legislation from that perspective when you are designing it and drafting it. You need to, to, to follow up on how it is working and what kind of, of results are being produced when it is being implemented. And you also need to go back to that ex post. So after a certain period of time uh, to to review what 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 has actually happened from a gender perspective and this process is not unrelated or unconnected to the processes that go on uh, that take place anyway in relation to 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 drafting and scrutiny of legislation ex ante or uh, ex post i'm just saying that these layer of analysis should be integrated in these processes, uh, um, um, in processes that are already taking place. So, making sure that that this this um, um, uh, type of scrutiny and these type of concerns, and I, when I'm talking about scrutiny, what I always have in mind are questions. You know, asking the questions. So. Thinking about looking at a rule and, and, and asking yourself, is this going to work for everyone? Is this going to affect men, women and non-binary people in the same way? Is there, is there a possibility that it might um, disadvantage uh, specific uh, uh, groups? It's, a, it's an exercise that you need to engage, engage in if you want, uh, if you want this to, 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 to um, uh, work. And then, Looking at the data that is produced from legislation, because every law that is implemented produces some kind of data, uh, looking at this data and, uh, if possible, from a, a, in a disaggregated form and, and from this perspective as well, can give you an indication of what might be going wrong so that you can intervene and correct that. And, of course, expost 
and, and as in the process of review of post-legislative scrutiny, you always have the chance to take a broader look at legislation and try to see whether it has achieved its goal, its broader uh, objectives, whether it has worked as it promised as or as it was intended to work, but also to what extent it has really um, uh, contributed to the other policy related objectives and one of them is gender equality it's not the only one but is uh, uh, an important one so ex ante what what gender sensitive scrutiny can offer is that it can uh, probably save you a lot of money uh, uh, as i um uh, think I made clear in the Irish uh, example that I used uh, before. So it can help you prevent uh, adverse results or unwanted results and thus save a lot of money that would be required or a lot of resources uh, that would be required in order to adverse, result, uh, adverse uh, results. And um, exposed, it can also highlight, you know, broader impacts that can be positive as well as negative broader impacts. And it can also see what is required to, um, to, to correct them. But I agree with Daniel on that, that we are moving forward. It can also show you, exposed scrutiny is important uh, because it can show you that, you know, we, we reached a state that we wanted to reach and it's, it's time to go further, you know, it's time to set further goals. It's time to push things uh, uh, further on. So, Ex post review has this potential of showing you not just whether and how the law worked, but also whether, you know, there is, uh, uh, the, the time is ripe for, for, um, uh, more advanced, uh, or mm, that's not a good word for more, um, innovative, uh, approaches or for more, for different, uh, approaches. And gender sensitive uh, scrutiny, I, I, in my mind, is, is really not uh, rocket science. If gender experts would hear me say that, they would probably say that I'm trying to undermine their, what they are doing and so on and so forth. And, but that's really not uh, true. Um, I think that it is a, a series of questions that have to do with linking different things that we are considering, but that we might forget when we are working on something. So you're working on the law and you tend to be consumed by, you know, what it is that you are trying to, to legislate on and, and the different uh, constitutional or other aspects of it and, and um, even the language issues and, and how things it's going to work and so on and so forth. And you might forget about other uh, things. Yet, it's, it's never complete if you forget about these other things. So, I mean, what gender sensitive scrutiny does is really trying to look at the legislative solution, if I can use that term, and try to link that to the situation of, of different groups of people based on their gender, based on their age, based on their disability or any other identity that you wish to um, uh, think of, uh, then try to see what, what potential impacts might be created and um, identify uh, alternative solutions that would achieve the best possible results for everyone. So the whole idea here is not to change the content of the law, but to adjust the content of the law so that it reflects the realities of the diverse groups that finally form what we call our target audiences or the, the, the subjects of um, uh, legislation. Because at the end of the day, legislation interacts or intervenes in the life of real uh, people. And yes, asking the right questions and collecting data and then reflecting on potential impact and then choosing a solution that is gender sensitive is what it's all um, about. And one last thing that I want to, to uh, say is that what is really important for this kind of scrutiny is that it's not a theoretical exercise. Using data... Uh, is extremely important because it, it links it to the reality of how things are and how things work for different uh, population groups. And it grounds your thinking also in, in, in um, uh, the way in which potential impacts might uh, evolve. So it's not just me saying and thinking, oh, yeah, maybe it will affect disabled people in such and such a way. It's looking at collecting the data and knowing how many, if you're um, um, working on a law 
on, on aspects of unemployment. I mean, knowing how many, uh, uh, what percentage of the unemployed are men and women and, and uh, young people or, or, or people in different uh, age groups and of distinct ethnic origin and so on. All this information can be used to improve the quality of your um, uh, decision making. So, I just want to say, to conclude with that, and say that gender-blind laws have proved time and time again to create inequalities and discrimination. And on top of that, if that sounds too theoretical or too abstract, they cost a lot of money when they have to, uh, when their impacts, their adverse impacts have to be um, uh, reversed. So it's it's high time, and there are processes happening and there are um, 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 tools that are or can be used in, in this to, to, to ensure that all these different rationales and all these different questions are integrated in the decision-making process that leads to um, uh, legislation, to gender-sensitive legislation or to inclusive legislation if we want to take this a, a step uh, further. And these laws are laws that can be effective, that can serve their, achieve their objectives, and at the same time, contribute also to horizontal goals that have to do with um, uh, gender equality. It's not the only one, but it's one of them. Thank you very much. And I hope that coming after Daniel yeah, and, and, and Helen, Helen. Um, and, uh, uh, that, that made, made at least a little bit of little sense. Bit. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Maria, for this great presentation. Uh, I would like just to say that I agree with you with the, the importance of collecting data. It's something that uh, we usually do uh, in linguistics uh, in order to say uh, 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 how things uh, uh, evolve in the past doing the sort of uh, diachronic analysis, but also um, highlighting some aspects that have to be change that are changing or completely start. It may be in language, in your case, it may be uh, inequalities. Uh, so thank you so much for stressing the importance of collecting data and reusing them in order to make uh, important changes such as uh, uh, um, uh, changing and uh, uh, avoiding inequalities. Thank you. Um, well, I would like to thank uh, the speaker of this first part of the morning. Helen, Daniel, Maria Rosmuti, very interesting, uh, amazing, amazing talk. And uh, of course, uh, 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 most people in the audience will be happy to address questions or raising comments. We have a chat box and we can uh, talk again uh, as soon as we start with the second part of the morning. And uh, uh, yes, let's have this coffee break and we will back at 10.50. London time. Okay? Okay. Fantastic. So I think that uh, we can start the second part of this morning. And uh, the topic of this uh, second session is learning from other legislative experiences. And the speaker for this second part of the morning are Thomas Glingo, King William Robinson, and Maria de Benedetto. Let me introduce uh, 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 Professor uh, Joaquin. It's a real pleasure to, to, to introduce uh, uh, Glyn, uh, Thomas Glyn Joaquin. He was educated at Port County Grammar School and the Pembroke College of School. He was called to the bar by the Middle Temple in 1976. From 1975, he lectured at Cardiff Law School, becoming professor of law in 2001. In 2004, he was appointed professor and head of the New York School at Bangor before returning to Cardiff in 2007 as first legislative counsel to the Welsh government. Now retired, he remains active as literary director of the Welsh Legal History Society, a council member of the Selden Society, a member of the Law Commission's Advisory Committee for Wales, a fellow of the Learned Society of Wales and an academic venture of the Middle Temple. His published works include The Italian Legal Tradition, 1997, An Historical Introduction to Modern Civil Law, 1999, The Legal History of Wales, Second Edition, 2012, and Legislative for Wales with Daniel Greenberg, 2018. 
Today's talk is on gender-neutral drafting, description, and prescription. In the abstract for his paper entitled Gender-Neutral Drafting Review from Wales, delivered in 2017, he indicated that towards its close, he would look at issues which may or may not complicate matters further in the future. He concluded towards the end of the paper that there may be yet the challenges to be faced in achieving gender neutrality now that drafting is set out along the road towards that goal, and that to settle for neutrality as between masculine and feminine may in itself face challenge as being narrow, prejudiced, and discriminatory. Now he will consider how appreciation of the nature of those fresh challenges has increased over the three years since that paper was written. In particular, it will examine how gender neutrality is no longer solely a matter of how laws describe the person to whom they apply, but also not prescribing specific gender to them. In particular, he will analyze the problems this poses for drafting legislation, examine possible solutions to them, and will address the issue there as laws try to keep pace with the developments in the societies they serve, so the language used in those societies, including the language used in framing their laws, must do the same. Thank you, Thomas. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you for those kind words of introduction, and thank you for the invitation to participate yet again uh, in this very interesting and useful series on seminars. As you just said, uh, back in 2017, I finished my paper to the workshop, uh, Gender Neutral Drafting the View from Wales, with an indication that I hoped at some time in the future to return to these issues, which, according to one's perspective, either threaten to complicate or promise to further matters such as gender neutrality. And as you quoted, I commented that to settle for neutrality as between masculine and feminine, may in itself face challenge as being narrow, prejudiced, and discriminatory. And I think from what we've already heard this morning, uh, it's quite clear uh, that that is happening. So the future has at least started to arrive over the last four years, and I hope to include in my contribution this morning some observations on what that may entail for lawmaking, including legislative draft. The initial focus of my paper, however, is to consider what may be learned from beyond Westminster and Whitehall concerning the way forward regarding law, language, and gender. My own perspective will be from within the United Kingdom, but from the viewpoint of one constituent nation, Wales, which not only has a devolved government and legislature, but is also distinctly different from Westminster with regard to lawmaking, in that its laws are made bilingually. And I note that one comment earlier this morning said that small jurisdictions may be able to point the way with regard to the resolution of some of the problems we are discussing. I'm now going to attempt to share my screen with you. So if you just give me a moment, uh, I will do that. As is the case with Scotland, contemporary lawmaking in Wales began in 1999. In the history of Welsh devolution over the 22 years which have since elapsed has been different from that of Scotland, because during that period the Welsh devolution settlement has undergone several major changes, and at least four distinct phases of devolution can be discerned. In 1999, under the first of its devolution settlements, Wales was given a National Assembly, but it could only make subordinate legislation by statutory instrument. In 2007, it acquired the potential to make primary legislation in the form of measures when competence to do so in relation to specific matters was from time to time conferred by the UK Parliament. In 2011, it acquired full competence to make primary legislation in relation to a wide range of devolved subjects. And then in 2018, this approach was replaced by one more akin to what Scotland had enjoyed since 1999, namely competence to legislate in relation to any matter which was not reserved to the UK Parliament, 
but that's subject to some general restrictions. Along the way, Welsh legislative competence has also been extended by the grant of some tax raising powers and has inevitably been affected by the withdrawal of the UK from the European Union. Some believe that this last development might result in an enhancement of legislative competence. However, as others feared, the actual outcome is that the UK government has, in the wake of Brexit, sought to arrogate to itself certain powers which make inroads into and thereby weaken, if not undermine, the devolution settlements of the constituent nations. While Brexit and the COVID pandemic have been taking their course, the former National Assembly has renamed itself Senedd Cymru, the Welsh Parliament. From its inception in 1999, the Welsh legislature, to employ a catch-all term to embrace all stages of its development, the Welsh Legislature aimed to produce its legislation bilingually. In this, it is distinct from the UK Parliament and the other devolved legislatures, at least at the present moment. Some of you would be aware that one of the difficulties currently facing devolved government in Northern Ireland concerns demands for an Irish Language Act, which one assumes might well result in bilingual legislation becoming a feature of lawmaking in Northern Ireland as well. It's possibly worth emphasizing that in Wales, both language versions are produced prior to laws being placed before the legislature for scrutiny, with all stages of the legislative process being conducted bilingually. Legislation is not translated into a second language after having been made. It is enacted and made in both languages. And for that reason, versions are required by statute to be treated as of equal standing for all purposes. It is also the case that from the very outset of devolution in 1999, the Welsh institutions of devolved government were committed to achieving gender neutrality in the legislation which they produced. This meant, therefore, that the quest for gender neutrality in the would be sought in a very different context from that in other parts of the UK because the needs of bilingualism would also have to be accommodated. This both distinguishes the legislative experience of Wales regarding gender neutrality, and also provides a possible comparator to assess the merits of different techniques of achievement. And that not only regarding English in the UK, but also within other bilingual jurisdictions. The task of making such an assessment is considerably assisted by the fact that the Welsh Government's Office of Legislative Council has produced a series of documents setting out guidance regarding its drafting practices. The documents themselves are available in both English and Welsh. The first was produced in 2012 and acknowledges the contribution of the UK's Office of Parliamentary Council on which a substantial part of the Welsh Government's document had been based. It also points out the significant contribution made by its own Legislative Translation Unit, as well as the inspiration obtained from conferences and publications of the Commonwealth Association of Legislative Council and the manuals of drafting offices and other common law jurisdictions around the world. A more recent guide entitled Writing Laws for Wales, was published in 2019. And it's on that document that I will mainly rely to provide evidence of the approach taken to gender neutrality within the bilingual lawmaking context of Wales, although I shall also make occasional reference to the earlier document. In passing, it's perhaps worth noting the considerable change of attitude on the part of drafting offices which the publication of such documents illustrates. Not so very long ago, the orthodox view was that how drafters performed their work was a personal professional matter. To provide guidance, let alone instruction, would have been deemed almost less majesté. Legislative drafting was perhaps the last art to survive as a mystery in the medieval sense of the word. The importance of individual professional judgment continues to be recognized in the contemporary guidance, emphasizing its descriptive rather than prescriptive nature, although the truth somewhat inevitably lies somewhere in between. 
My own opinion has for some time tended to the view that an element of prescription is unavoidable once one commits to standards such as accessibility, bilingualism, and gender neutrality. And there can be no doubt in that the element of prescription is there. The Welsh guidance notes that the presiding officer's determination on proper form for public bills states that the English language text of a bill must not use gender-specific language unless the meaning of the provision cannot be expressed in any other way. For example, the provision is one that relates only to persons of a particular gender. Noticeably, the instruction is limited to the English language text, and I will return to this later. The guidance continues by noting that the use of gender-specific language that is in breach of the principle just quoted is a ground upon which the committee which scrutinizes the quality of legislation from a legal and constitutional perspective may make a negative reporting point understanding orders. As with the Interpretation Act at Westminster, the Legislation Wales Act 2019 provides that in Welsh legislation, words denoting persons of a particular gender are not to be read as limited to persons of that gender. But the drafting office guidance having noted this adds the drafters should not rely on this section to achieve a gender neutral outcome. Instead, they are told to ensure that legislation uses gender neutral language which does not make assumptions about the gender of people performing a particular role unless the role is limited to people of a particular gender. Another issue to which I will return later. Drafters are also told to avoid using gender specific pronouns that is, he or she, and gender-specific nouns, such as fireman or manageress. It is, however, noted that gender-specific language will nevertheless be appropriate where legislation can only apply to people of a specific gender, for example, in legislation about pregnancy and childbirth. The 2019 guidance then returns to the limitation in the presiding officer's determination on proper form to the effect that the prohibition on the use of gender-specific language only applies to the English language text of bills. It states that these issues do not arise in the same way in the Welsh language text. In Welsh, nouns have grammatical gender and pronouns follow the grammatical gender of the nouns to which they correspond. The grammatical gender of a noun or pronoun does not necessarily imply anything about the gender of a person. And we've already heard this morning, I think, in comments from uh, Spain, that the same is true in other European languages. The point made is crucial. It insists upon maintaining what may be termed of the two language versions. I concluded my paper in 2017 with these words, that respect for linguistic diversity entails acceptance that how gender neutrality is achieved is likely to be language specific. The notion that an English-based solution is suitable for export or even imposition is in itself disrespectful and antagonistic the culture of diversity and inclusivity which gender neutrality seeks to serve. It should not be allowed to happen. The good news from here is that it hasn't been allowed to happen in Wales. With regard to the avoidance of gender-specific pronouns in English, the 2019 guidance sets out a variety of techniques, as did its predecessor in 2012. These include rephrasing a sentence so as to avoid needing to refer back to the subject by means of a pronoun or by omitting the phrase containing the reference. So that instead of writing a justice of the peace may issue a warrant if he is satisfied, one can write the justice of the peace may issue a warrant if satisfied. Using a participle instead of a subject and verb 
for example, instead of stating that when an inspector enters premises, he must, one can simply say when entering premises, an inspector must. Using who or whose, who being a gender-free pronoun which can avoid the need for a reference back containing a gender-specific pronoun or a repeated noun. Thus, instead of saying a person commits an offence if he contravenes subsection 1, one can provide that a person who contravenes subsection 1 commits an offence. Occasionally, it will be possible to employ the gender-neutral who's in the same way, so that instead of if a person's application is refused, he may appeal, one could have a person whose application is refused may appeal. Using the, that, or those instead of a possessive pronoun, although the guidance acknowledges that this approach can sometimes make it more difficult to identify the link between the subject and the noun. For example, the, the commissioner holds and vacates that position in accordance with his terms of appointment uh, would become the commissioner holds and vacates that position in accordance with the terms of appointment. The use of an impersonal or passive construction may be appropriate. For instance, by saying that it is an offence for a person to do something, rather than saying that a person commits an offence if he does that thing. Likewise, the passive voice of the verb can be used instead of the active voice. But this too requires care, because the passive voice uh, may be less clear. Repeating the noun instead of using a pronoun, although as a technique this too requires caution with regard to its use, as repeating the same noun several times or constantly repeating a compound noun can lead to awkward and cumbersome provisions. Using a defined term or label, so that instead of repeating a compound noun, it may be possible to use a shorter defined term or even a letter label. For instance, a person P. The guidance against again warns that while such techniques can be useful, nevertheless they can produce awkward provisions, and recognizes that while letter labels can help to distinguish between two or more different people, they do not reflect normal usage, other than perhaps I feel forced to add for lawyers who get used to them as students when answering problem questions and examinations. Using a plural noun for the subject, and thereafter referring back to the gender-neutral plural pronouns, they, their, them, and themselves. Indeed, it has become, or is becoming, acceptable, if not quite as the guidance claims natural, to do this in spoken English, but when referring back to singular nouns. In fairness, the guidance does note that the correctness of this practice is disputed so that it should probably be avoided in legislation unless there is no better way of achieving gender neutrality. That question of they has already been discussed in part this morning, uh, and I'll come back to it in the bilingual context in a moment. These techniques of avoiding gender-specific pronouns were also to be found in the earlier 2012 guidance that were not specifically described as methods of avoidance in English. Instead, after the discussion, instead, after the discussion of each individual technique and some appropriate examples, that document added a note which appeared almost as a refrain throughout the section. It read, no translation is provided as the grammatical gender system in Welsh means that no issues arise in relation to gender neutrality the readers being referred back to the explanation that, in Welsh, the pronoun should always follow the grammatical gender of the noun, even if the English draft uses his, her, a construction which it noted was best avoided in English as well. The 2012 guidance did offer what it described as accumulating pronouns as one technique which was in use, but cautioned that it was arguably not truly gender neutral and advised, advised that it should be avoided 
unless there is no better way of achieving general neutral drafting. Indeed, it went further and warned that overuse of the method leads to inelegant sentences and is distracting and an effect exacerbated when a non-gender specific pronoun is also needed to cover the eventuality of the person referred to being a body rather than an individual, he, she, or it. The 2019 guidance, while recording that the formulation has been common, has been common in legislation, advised use as it can be awkward and is not truly gender neutral. Likewise, an important difference between Welsh and English was noted in the earlier document regarding the use of the passive rather than the active voice of the verb, which the guidance stated to be a solution specific to a problem arising in English. In standard literary Welsh, the guidance noted, it was not necessary to use pronouns at all unless there was a need to emphasize that it was a particular person who performed the action. A scriven of letter can mean either he wrote a letter or she wrote a letter. No pronoun is needed in Welsh. Adding the pronoun adds emphasis. A scriven of a letter, he wrote the letter. A scriven of he letter, it was she who wrote the letter. Accordingly, substituting the passive voice for the active voice, while useful in English, makes no difference to statements in Welsh where the use of an offending pronoun is unnecessary. Indeed, to introduce a pronoun where not needed, and thereby create a problem needing a solution, would be an example of how a slavish insistence on word-for-word -word alignment between the language versions can undermine their quality. One technique which was identified in the 2012 document as being helpful in Welsh as well as in English is the use of plural nouns as the subject of provisions. Although the admittedly controversial technique, as we've heard this morning, of using the plural in English when referring to singular nouns is not a technique possible in Welsh, as the document states in terms that in Welsh, the plural pronoun hoi can only refer to plural nouns. I think the point that was made earlier this morning, speaking of uh, Spanish, with the consequence that if the English text were to employ the technique, the Welsh version could not follow suit. It would have to utilize the pronoun which agreed with a number and therefore gender of the relevant noun. Which brings us to the question of how to deal with gender-specific nouns as opposed to pronouns. The 2019 guidance states that in the English language text of legislation, words denoting or implying a particular gender should be avoided unless reference to a particular gender is intended. And drafters are advised that in deciding upon a gender neutral alternative, they should be aware that nouns such as testator, manager, and landlord can today be regarded as gender neutral despite having feminine forms, because the feminine forms are falling out of use. With regard to such forms, they are warned that nouns ending in S, such as manager S, should be avoided. In Welsh, on the other hand, masculine nouns ending in UR, W -R, equivalent to man in English, are not necessarily male-specific even where there is a corresponding female form ending in rai. Therefore, it may be and often is entirely appropriate to use the ur ending. The general policy is to use well-established terms, therefore, rather than to coin new terms, which may appear to be more gender neutral, although there may be cases where an alternative to the ur ending is more appropriate. An alternative to the ur ending is the is ending when perhaps popularly viewed as more gender neutral. However, the guidance advises that it should be used only if it is natural to do so in the absence of there being an already well-established term. 
The third alternative is to use pairs of masculine and feminine nouns, but again, this should, where possible, we are told be avoided, as it results in unnatural and cumbersome provisions requiring pairs of pronouns and their corresponding mutations in the Welsh language, something I spoke about back in 2017. At the end of the day, legislative translators and drafters need to form a view on whether a specific Welsh noun is gender neutral or not. Which brings me back to some of the issues to which I said I would return earlier. In advising against reliance on a standard rules of interpretation, which presume that words denoting persons of a particular gender are not to be read as limited to persons of that gender, the 2019 guidance tells doctors that they should ensure that legislation uses gender neutral language which does not make assumptions about the gender of people performing a particular role, unless the role is limited to people of a particular gender. But this begs the question as to which roles are limited in this way. I drew attention in my paper in 2017 to a range of roles which a century, half a century, or even a shorter time ago would have been regarded as limited to one gender, from jockeys to judges, or from barristers to bishops. While in most of these cases, it is now settled and accepted that the roles are not limited to one gender alone, in others, it would be insensitive, if not offensive, to ignore the fact that controversy continues to exist concerning whether a role is so limited or not. While the role of bishop or priest is open to men and women in many Christian churches, in other mainstream global churches, the same is not true, and such a division of opinion on similar matters is present in other world faiths as well. Gender neutral drafting can assist in avoiding, if not resolving, such controversies, but there are areas in which avoidance itself might be seen as insensitive or offensive. The introduction of same sex marriage is one such area. While such unions are lawful in many countries, several mainstream faith communities in those countries with responsible responsibilities for the conduct of marriage ceremonies are not required by law to participate in their solemnization. The drafting of laws concerning marriage, therefore, where the law is attempting to respect the sensitivities of those on both sides of the argument, will require a great deal of ingenuity if some sort of neutrality is to be achieved. I cannot resist mentioning here that the Welsh language may already have a resolution for this problem, for in Welsh, uh, the word for a couple in a matrimonial, matrimonial context is daithi, the components of which word die and dean literally translate as two men. Daithi is a masculine noun, again illustrating that the gender of nouns and pronouns in a language such as Welsh carries no implication about the gender of a person or hear the persons in question. Some will undoubtedly say that trying to respect some will undoubtedly some will undoubtedly say that trying to respect both sides of a debate where the law has already come to a decision is unnecessary. Legislation should reflect what the law knows, regardless of differences of opinion. However, there are issues of gender where legal as opposed to linguistic neutrality is less easily achieved. And it would be interesting to see how the language of legislation will respond to the challenge of either prescribing or not prescribing gender in certain circumstances, such, for example, as the registration of births, marriages, and deaths. Such choices are policy choices, the legal consequences of which those drafting laws will have to express. And many of the techniques that have been advanced with regard to gender neutral drafting may prove their worth here again. Lastly, it shouldn't be forgotten that it's not only laws and the techniques for drafting them which change. Language changes too. The Welsh guidance may be too cautious in advising 
against the gender-free plural pronouns they, them, and their when referring to a singular noun. The gradual acceptance of this in spoken English may indicate the direction in which the language is developing. Many languages, including Welsh, employ the second person plural as a polite form of the verb, while other languages use the third person singular and plural to the same effect. Such usage, usage must have come to be accepted at some stage in their development. In the absence of any body such as the Académie Française with regard to French, or as we heard earlier this morning, the Royal Academy with regard to Spanish, with the authority to determine such questions definitively with regard to the English language, it is certainly not the function of legislative drafters to be prescriptive. But equally, they should probably avoid being so cautious that they might obstruct the gradual acceptance of a developing usage. To my knowledge, no one has ever objected to the use of the neuter program when parents announce the birth of a child with the words, it's a boy or it's a girl. It? It's accepted usage. Jochen Baum, thank you for listening. Thank you, Thomas, for such interesting, very interesting and in-depth uh, 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 glance on the Welsh uh, uh, strategies to try to avoid uh, gender specificity. Um, actually, uh, in order to uh, keep strict with the, the, the schedule, the program today, um, uh, of course, I'm sure that there are questions to, uh, to, to ask to uh, Professor Working, but I suggest to, to uh, uh, raise these questions uh, uh, at the end of the third speaker, the talk of the third speaker. Uh, so I ask uh, William to, uh, to start his presentation. Th Thomas, do you agree? Uh, actually, uh, um, we will have some time after the end of uh, Maria de Benedetto's talk. So uh, please go ahead, uh, William, and uh, let me first introduce to the audience. Thank you, Thomas. So questions uh, for Professor Walking at the end of the third speaker for this morning. Um, yes, uh, 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 let me introduce William Robinson. Uh, uh, he worked for many years in the field of EU law and language, first at the Court of Justice of the European Union, and then at the European Commission. In the Commission's legal service, he coordinated a team of 20 lawyers who revised the Commission's uh, draft legal acts and legislative proposals. Since 2010, he has been engaged in research into European Union legislative drafting issues and the EU legal language at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in London and teaching legislative drafting in particular to the staff of the EU institutions. Today, this very interesting talk will be on gender neutrality in EU drafting. The legislative drafters in EU institutions have lagged far behind drafters in the English speaking world in making their texts gender neutral. It is also in recent years that the EU approach to gender neutrality has changed. This contribution looks at the current state of the EU guidance on the issue and at what happens in practice. It also considers some of the factors that make gender neutral drafting more complicated for the EU institutions. Thank you, William. The floor is yours. Okay, I hope everyone can hear me. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much to Professor Panisi for the invitation to this workshop, which is, as ever, very stimulating. I've enjoyed the wide-ranging contributions from the, the previous speakers. And my focus will be rather a narrow one on drafting itself. Um, so I too was at the seminar at the workshop in 2017, when I examined the EU's approach to gender neutrality in its legislative drafting. And at that time, I noted that even though the EU stresses its commitment to gender equality in both the basic treaties and in its Charter of Fundamental Rights, 
the actual drafting of the treaties is far from gender neutral. So let me just share my screen so that you can all see what I'm talking about. Um, what I'm going to do is look at what has changed over the last four years since 2017, the last workshop. And so, first of all, I'm just going to summarise briefly the past practice of the EU. And then I'm going to look at all the EU guidance, um, both on legislative drafting and on gender neutral techniques. Um, I know that Daniel has said that all manuals are heresy, but I'm afraid in the EU system, they're very important. We have a lot of them and they are important because we have a decentralized system of drafting, which I'll come back to. And because as you know, we have um, 24 official languages in the EU institutions. And it is very, very common for the people producing the drafts to be non-native speakers of the language concern. And then I'm going to turn to what happens in practice now to see how the EU's practice seems to have changed. And then as a sort of conclusion, I'm going to look at some of the factors that make it more complicated for the EU perhaps to change its approach. So if we go back to the Lisbon Treaty in 2007, um, the general approach was quite clear. The traditional approach to drafting in the, in the EU institutions was to make no concessions at all to gender neutral language. There was widespread use of the gender of the generic masculine. And so in this case, in Article 18 of the Treaty on European Union, you see the high representative was automatically a he. He shall contribute by his proposals to the development of that policy, which he shall carry out as mandated by the council. And that had long been the standard practice. But I think it was probably round about the, the, the time of Lisbon that we came to see a slightly different approach, but only in certain special cases when it was clear that a provision was um, specifically addressed to the, the citizen. And here we have an example, any citizen of the union um, and any natural or legal person um, may address, shall have the right to address a position to the European Parliament on a field which affects him, her, or it directly. So there it was obvious to the drafter that a citizen, they had to take account of different genders. That, that approach continued, um, I think in 2016, um, I, I found that it was commonplace for most regulations and directives to refer to any person as a he, an importer, places a subsystem on, on them or a safety component on the market under his name or trademark. But again, there were special, the special cases where it was quite clear that a natural person was involved. And there, in accordance with one of the guidelines, guideline three, which stated that drafters were to take account of the addressees of their provisions, there they would quite often insert him or her, always in that order, never her or him, I'm afraid. And I would say that that was broadly the e standard EU approach up to the time of the last workshop here in 2017. So then I, I mentioned all our legislative, all the EU's legislative drafting rules. Um, there are a lot of them. Some of them are common to all the institutions. Some of them are particular to one or other of the institutions. Um, in the EU legislative procedure, these rules and, and the, the written guidance are particularly important because there is not a single cadre of technical of specialist legislative drafters. Instead, the first draft of all EU legislation is produced by technical experts in the technical department of the commission responsible for the field in question. And those drafts are then the basis for all the subsequent consultations and discussions and negotiations, first of all, within the Commission. And as part of that process, those drafts would come to the Commission Legal Service where I worked, and teams of legal revisers would go through those drafts and try to improve them. But it was very much a revision process. It was not drafting afresh, it was revising what the technical drafters had produced. 
At the end of the process within the commission, the drafts were translated into all the 24 languages and adopted by the commission as a formal proposal. The proposal was then submitted to the European Parliament and to the Council in all the languages. But within the Parliament and the Council, they needed to focus on a single language version. It was not possible to conduct negotiations in all 24 languages at every stage simultaneously. And so, once again, the focus would be um, directed to the English version. And um, most negotiations would um, consist of amendments made to the English text. At the end of the procedure within the Parliament and the Council, once an agreement was shaping up, then the amendments would all be translated and the necessary ones incorporated in the Commission's proposal. And that would then become the text of the Act, which was again um, revised by loyal linguists in the European Parliament and the Council to try to um, bring together all, all the different strands or to make sure all the amendments fitted in correctly, to make sure that all the texts correspond. Um, and so you can see that another reason why this, so it's a one reason for the um, written drafting rules and manuals being important is that so many people are involved in the process. And the other obvious reason is that even though at practically at most stages, the English text was the most important one, um, very few of those involved in the drafting process would actually be native speakers of English. Um, I had a look at the latest figures for the European Commission staff, and it is less than 4% of the Commission staff are from Ireland or from the United Kingdom. So we can, we can understand that less than 4% of them would be native speakers of, of English. Um, I should also point out that even though there is a lot of, um, there are a, num a number of rules and a lot of guidance, um, what the EU has not got is an interpretation act. So even though the traditional practice was to refer to he and to deem it implicit that um, that included both, both genders, um, there was no interpretation act establishing that principle. So these are the legislative drafting rules, but apart from those rules, there are now increasingly rules on um, gender neutral drafting, gender central dra sensitive drafting or inclusive drafting. Um, the European Parliament is very proud of the fact that it was the first EU institution to adopt guidance on gender neutral language back in 2008. Um, you can see from these extracts that the EP stresses its commitment to gender equality, including gender neutral language, but cautions that not all so solutions that would work elsewhere can be used in the context of legislation. The guidance goes on to um, give a number of, um, of, of suggestions for techniques that can be used. Um, it says that guidance, that, that language that is not gender inclusive should be avoided in legislative acts as far as possible. And, and this is the key that they always um, have this get out, they hedge their, their guidance around with, with, with uh, these riders. Um, efforts should be made to reduce such use to a minimum again, so that they acknowledge that it is not always possible to do that. The council has only very recently adopted guidance on um, inclusive drafting. Um, it's designed to avoid um, using discriminatory language unintentionally. They refer, of course, to the political nature of the institution, the multilingual environment. But um, the bit I would draw your attention to is that the guide expressly says that it does not cover EU legislation. This was their 2018 guidance, and then it gives the different techniques that we've probably already heard of elsewhere. Um, it does illustrate those techniques with examples, but also cautions that, that some of them make the text particularly clumsy, clumsy or cumbersome. 
The Publications Office of the European Union is responsible for issuing guidance for all the EU institutions and agencies, and in fact, for everybody working for the U European Union. This guidance is prominently posted online, and it is constantly being updated in all the languages. It's available in 24 languages. Um, as you can see, it states that much existing EU legislation is not gender neutral, and the masculine pronouns he, etc., are used generically to include women. And it goes on, however, gender neutral language is nowadays preferred wherever possible. So again, the get out there. Um, the Star Guide also points out that some of the solutions it, it puts forward um, lead to results that are clumsy, I'm afraid. The legislative drafters in the Commission have, like the other legislative drafters, that's sorry, the loyal linguists of the Commission, the Parliament and the Council, none of them have issued guidance on gender neutral drafting. But the linguists in the institutions do do that, in particular those in the European Commission. Um, the European Commission employs over 2,000 staff in its translation department, and the ones working on the English language have long issued a useful guide on the style to be used in Commission texts in English. They update it regularly, and the current version dates from 2021. Um, so they repeat the guidance that, that can also be found in the Publications Office Interinstitutional Style Guide. But one development that um, I noticed in their most recent update is they no longer recommend the use of he or she as a gender neutral alternative. Um, this is perhaps going to be a problem for some drafters in the EU because for many of them, the solution to their problems was he or she, him or her. And you can see that this is a regulation I, I took from 2018, where they, they simply replaced um, any reference to he by he or she, any reference to him by him or her. Um, so they achieved a sort of gender neutrality. But I think um, we can perhaps see that the text is, is rather clumsy. I think one of the reasons why this solution is favoured by EU drafters is but it has no impact on the other language versions. So everyone producing a text uh, in the European Union is conscious that it has got to be reflected in 23 other language versions. And the advantage of the he or she technique is that in languages which have grammatical gender, they can simply disregard that change in the English text. And this does not apply to some of the other solutions proposed, which is perhaps why they are regarded as more problematic. So for, uh, for this workshop, I checked all the EU legislative acts that were adopted in 2020. That is all the regulations and directives adopted by the European Parliament and the Council, apart from those that amend other acts because they would not reflect the, the latest state of, of drafting um, technique. I think my conclusion, for, there are not that many of them. Um, I, I searched through them using text search techniques. And I think my conclusion is that the message that drafters must address the issue of gender neutrality is certainly bedding down. There was a lot of, they were, they were all conscious of it. I found, I think, just one single example of himself being used without herself. That, that, was, that, that was my conclusion. So, so, so they, have no longer, they no longer use he on its own. But I did find that the default solution using he or she is still very common. Um, there were attempts to use other solutions, such as repetition of nouns and use of passives. And here we see an example of repetition of nouns, which I think, again, has produced rather a clumsy result. Um, and this is one of the dangers of, of these techniques. Um, just uh, as an aside, I actually found two instances of 
her or his being used in the general data protection regulation. So they actually put the female form, the feminine form first, um, but only, only two examples in one single part of that text. So I don't think that's going to be a general practice. So we've seen some of the complicating factors in the um, EU process. The legislative drafting process in the European Union involves three supranational institutions which are independent of each other. No one of them can give orders to the other two. Each of them stands alone. Or that the best that they can do is to agree together common rules, but that takes some doing. It, it, it's um, only happened on, on a relatively few occasions, a, a small number of inter-institution agreements on matters of legislative uh, approaching legislation. So the three institutions, the European Parliament itself has 705 members, um, which are directly elected in all the member states, and they're divided into seven groups, not by nationality, but by political affiliation. The Council consists of representatives of the 27 member states, but it also meets at very many different levels, the technical level, when technical experts come from each member state to discuss proposals, but also the, um, the diplomatic level, the representatives of the member states permanently based in Luxembourg, and then also the level of the ministers of each of the member states for the formal decisions of the council. And the commission itself has over 32,000 staff in some 40 different departments. The 24 official languages all have their own specificities. Um, it's not possible when you're drafting in one language to take account of exactly how that is going to be rendered in all 23 other languages, as I hope that uh, is possible in, in the Welsh context. Um, in the European context, what we had to aim for were solutions that could be reflected in all other languages. Um, so so we, we didn't couldn't think of specifically how it would be reflected in French, but we had to choose a, a, a neutral solution that might be effective in all languages. The other aspect that we need to, to take account of in the European Union system is the different cultural attitudes of the member states. We couldn't assume that everyone thought as we did. And this is where I think it's important. This is taken from the EU's gender equality strategy 2020 to 2025, a document produced last year. And in this, they quoted from a Eurobarometer survey of European citizens in June 2017. As part of this survey, they put statements to the respondents and asked them to agree or disagree with them. One statement was, the most important role of a woman is to take care of her home and family. The rate of agreement with that across all European countries was 44% agreed. But within individual states, there were enormous differences. For example, in this case, in Bulgaria, 81% of the respondents agreed with that statement. On the other hand, in Sweden, only 11% agreed with it. So there is a wide range of cultural differences. Just um, for the sake of uh, comparison, in the United Kingdom, the rate of agreement was 36%. And then similarly with the other statement, the most important role of a man is to earn money. Across the whole of the European Union, 43% of respondents agreed with that statement. But the differences were the same again, 81% in Bulgaria, only 10% in Sweden, 36% in the UK. So it is important for the European Union to take account of these differences in cultural approach across its member states. So if I can sum up, I would say that the European legislative drafting is moving towards a more gender neutral approach, a more inclusive approach. Um, progress has perhaps been slow because of the multilingual and multicultural nature of the European Union. Um, Professor Santhaki also suggested that civil law systems are slower to adapt than Westminster, which can be more nimble. There is a lot of guidance available 
for drafters in the EU, but it's not consistent. Uh, this is because of the difficulty of getting agreement between all those different the, the different institutions and the different member states. But I would also suggest that the EU legislative drafting experts are lagging behind their own guidance. So the European Parliament and the Council have issued guidance on um, inclusive drafting, but the legislative, um, the, the legal linguistic experts in the Parliament and the Council and the Commission um, do not take account of any of that guidance in their own drafting rules. So I think it is time for the um, legal linguistic experts of the institutions to face the issue and to come up with some position on it, that they cannot simply bury their heads in the sand any longer. I think one explanation is that they are cautious because they are aware of how difficult it is to reach agreement on any EU legislative text. And they fear that any new rules on gender neutral drafting would further undermine the quality of EU texts. Um, on a final note, I wonder if you all remember the Sofa Gate scandal when um, this, this was in April, I think, of this year, when there was an, an official EU delegation to Turkey and the president of the European Council, Charles Michel, and the president of the European Commission, visited Turkey to um, talk to President Erdogan of Turkey. When they entered the room that had been prepared for them, there were only two chairs um, put out for the main participants. And Charles Michel, the president of the European Council, immediately took one of those chairs, and President Erdogan of uh, Turkey took the other chair. And the figure you see that the, the back is of Ursula van der Leyen, who the commission president was left standing. There was no chair prepared for him. Some commentators saw this as um, an illustration of the rivalry between the EU institutions, the European Council grabbing a seat before the commission was able to get there. Others regarded it as an example of gender stereotyping. And I'll perhaps leave you with the cartoon um, produced by the Belgian cartoonist Kroll, who often does comments on EU matters, and he shows um, Charles Michel saying, Ursula, perhaps you could make us a cup of coffee? And President Erdogan congratulating him saying, you know how to speak to women, Charles. This is one of the EU's problems. We have to cope with all these different cultural approaches. Thanks very much. Thank you, William. Uh, I mean, you were able in very, very short time to uh, talk about the, 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 the concrete real problems that the European institutions are still facing in terms of uh, uh, gender fair, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, representation, if we want, of uh, uh, both genders. And uh, Yes, you are right indeed. Actually, somehow, particularly with this last example, which is quite recent, I mean, it raised a lot of debate, not only within European institutions, but in a single member state, for instance, Italy, in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, unbalanced uh, 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 treatment of men and women, with lots of cartoons, of course, we laugh very much, but indeed, it exemplifies, resembles the, the, the huge struggle that right now, till now, women have to fight in order to be recognized above and beyond uh, the position, uh, the occupation that uh, they have. Because in particular, this last fact uh, exemplifies the fact that uh, in that moment, Ursula Anders uh, wasn't a, we, a, a woman, actually. She was representing, and she still represents, the European Commission. So it actually um, uh, um, forced us to go back, I mean, lots of uh, decades, uh, uh, and uh, forced us to think again about uh, how language represents uh, culture represents stereotypes, represents uh, 
a non-gender fair representation of, uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, male and uh, women and men, actually. Thank you. Thank you so much, William. I'm sure that there are questions, but to stick it with the, the program, I suggest you to go ahead with the third speaker at the end of the third talk. Uh, we will open uh, the debate. Okay. Thank you, William. Thank you so much. So, uh, uh, the last speaker of this very long morning, exciting morning, is Maria de Benedetto. I mean, all of you are friends, friends of mine. I should say, a good friend, all of you, all of you. But let's get back to the, my introduction. And Maria de Benedetto is a professor of administrative law at the Department of Political Science at Roma 3 University. She has been an advisor to a number of national and international institutions, including the Italian Competition Authority, the Presidency of the Italian Council of Ministers, the OECD. She has been part of various public bodies, such as Commission for the Revision of Civil Code for Heritage and the Unit for the Identification and Quality of Regulation. She is the author of books and articles on several administrative law issues, among others, competition, regulation, corruption, administrative proceedings, public property, administrative authorities, regulatory enforcement and controls, education, law and language, trust and institutions. She is going to publish a book with heart, Corruption from a Regulatory Perspective, and she is currently writing in English, French and Italian on the topic of law effectiveness. Uh, a talk today is on gender versus post-gender language drafting from an Italian perspective. Um, she adopts a public law perspective in order to focus on gender fair language policies and drafting by considering both language neutralization and language differentiation in some legal systems characterized by different languages. The question is analyzed with special reference to the Italian context, firstly focusing on Italian public debate and secondly on Italian drafting regulation. However, the problem seems recently to be reconfigured in the Italian public debate on the basis of post-gender ideology which aims to change the language differentiation practice, typical of Italian gender language drafting, into language neutralization. While a criticism is coming from differentialist feminists, some other relevant and more general criticisms regarding the gender language struggle may be formulated on the basis of constitutional and fundamental rights argument. Thank you, Maria. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Julia. Participating in a law and language work with, uh, workshop is always a pleasure and my only regret is not to be in presence. Uh, hoping that very soon uh, we will solve this little problem as a, as a change of our life. So I uh, we start to share my screen, hoping that uh, uh, share. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. Okay. Allora, all is working, I think. Uh, my presentation is organized as follows. I firstly uh, analyze gender fail language in the Italian public debate and drafting and post-gender fail language in the Italian public debate because there is no specific uh, drafting regulation in matter. But in this uh, specific frame, I will uh, propose uh, and uh, uh, mention a criticism from an Italian differentialist uh, feminism perspective to the post-gender fair language. After, I will uh, formulate uh, and consider a reading from a linguistic administrative constitutional fundamental rights perspective in the integrating uh, a different argument by concluding with a warning and a plea. So just uh, 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 to make a first point, uh, gender fail language in the Italian public debate and drafting. Uh, let me clarify a point and essential introductory remark. We have two different uh, uh, kind of gender fail language. 
differentiating and neutralization. Differentiating or differentiation is typical of grammatical gender language countries, Italy, French, Spain, uh, which imply to refer both to men and women, while neutralization, which is uh, uh, typical or prevalent in English uh, language countries, in language speaking countries, uh, implies uh, to eliminate uh, uh, references to men and women. Yes, but uh, we have to remember one thing, because uh, the problem of uh, inclusive language is not so simple as it, it appears at the first look, because differentiation and neutralization are also in their uh, back different conception of equality, equal treatment, because in some countries the idea is making the feminine sex, non-gender, because we can look at the sex, but the gender is a different perspective. Also via the widest possible use of grammatical gender in other countries, making the grammatical gender neutral or as less visible as possible. In any case, language is at the center. And this, in some way, is evoking the idea that the feminist thought and uh, 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 the backstage uh, of this uh, discussion is uh, in some way double egalitarian feminism and differentialist feminism. I'm so sorry to be so rough uh, in the description, but I have to uh, go to my point. The gender language debate uh, in Italy may be dated, uh, have a date, because in 1986 uh, 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 there has been uh, the adoption or the uh, publication of the recommendation for a non-sexist use of Italian language. And uh, in the comparative analysis of uh, uh, existing guidelines uh, on this matter, uh, this uh, 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 publication is defined as relatively old. This is one of the first publication. The idea which can from the important debate in differentialist feminism is that a change in a masculine to feminine is always possible, even if sometimes it's strange, cacophonous, or inelegant. The tool is feminization. The uh, other tool to achieve non-discriminatory language policies is distinguishing male and female via doubling practice. The list of the official documents, which uh, in some way uh, can be considered the uh, drafting regulation, uh, gender drafting uh, regulation in Italy, are very, uh, uh, very famous uh, in Italy. The first is in 1993, the Style Code for Written Communication in Public Administration, adopted when Sabino Cassese was minister, in which a section is devoted to non sexist and non-discriminatory use of language. But after we have a directive of the Ministry of Administrative Reform, a guide to uh, uh, administrative drafting uh, uh, of the Italian National Research Council, together with the Linguistic Academy, the Academia della Crusca. And after there was an opening of an incredible a plethora of uh, regional legislation, each one adopting a formula and on the basis of the extemporaneous uh, uh, idea of what should be the best way to draft on uh, uh, what was specifically in this context. And this has a, 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 consists in a, a complication of the drafting regulation. Let's now go to the post-gender fair language in the Italian public debate. Post-genderism is a social, political, cultural movement which aims at eroding the cultural, psychological, and social role of gender, the binary gender, even though the binary sex remain binary and probably the use in the language may be considered as a, a projection also of the sex, not only of the gender. But 
Italian is a grammatical gender language. Feminization and doubling are the techniques adopted so far by non-sexist drafting. Post-genderism claims for a change in the Italian towards the so-called inclusive Italian. By advocating for a shift in the gender fail policy from feminization and doubling to strict neutralization. And among the symbols, there are the Shua and the asterisk. So what may happen if we adopt this idea? I have an experience, very simple to communicate, because it regards the emailing internal to my department. The expression is cari tutti in gender and post-gender fail language. Cari tutti means dear all. It's so simple in English. It's so simple in, if we were English. No. Cari tutti is a formula which in Italian is overextended inclusive masculine and which is considered to be definitely replaced. But if we are in the gender fail language traditional, but also in the post-gender fail language. But the solution may be not uh, 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 always the same. So in the gender language proposal solution, we have cari tutti e care tutte, a mixed formula in which use the last vowel, uh, uh, vowel uh, uh, and uh, I uh, put together the, the, the male and the female, care i tutte i, or care point i and care point i or the slash. In the post-gender language, we are where overextended feminine, circumlocution to indicate all the persons who are in the same uh, situation. The use of the you, caru, tutu, uh, omission of the last vowel, underscore, asterisk, at, la shua, x, y, apostrophe. The situation was chaotic. This is a definition from the Academy of the Crusca, so it's not my definition, chaotic in the Italian gender language, and risk to become chaotic also in a post-gender language drafting context. In concrete situation, people use different formulas, each one following their own preferences. There would be no common way, but there seems to be no special reason to prefer one solution over another. So we have also a criticism from a feminist perspective because post-genderism aims, aims to overcome binary gender also via language neutralization. So Maria, a writer, uh, where we say that we have the problem that the E and she are not uh, the only because there is also who want to overcome the binary. But uh, the problem in Italia is that uh, the movement of differentialist feminism has long time and with uh, mm, reasonable grounds uh, advocated for a sex dual language by indicating that the neutral is a temptation because once again, it obliterates the female. And this is a problem because the problem is that uh, sex is binary. I put a problem and hoping that we can uh, discuss together in the light uh, of uh, uh, proposed also by uh, Daniel. So uh, uh, I would like to propose uh, um, some arguments uh, uh, which integrate linguistic, constitutional, administrative and fundamental right perspective in order to discuss the problem. First argument, uh, uh, these standard gender fail language and post gender fail language are prescription or suggestion we, are, uh, we have to solve the ambiguity. We have to solve uh, the uh, comparative analysis of guidelines uh, as observed that uh, uh, these standards are characterized by limited coercion and difficulties in implementation. Yes, because they are soft law, droit souple. Law characterized by graduated or weak prescriptivity. And this is a problem because uh, this is a very critical point in legal theory. But if, if we have no possibility to, to remain in the rhetoric of persuasion, we are in the idea that uh, something is uh, for sure inclusive, uh, and we have because inclusion is good, uh, we have uh, 
ideological solutions which are contested. We are more than one opinion about the best way to draft. The problem has no self-evident solution, at least in Italian. So we need to choose a two force. And we have a non-mandatory suggestion, but if uh, it's a non-mandatory, no enforcement is possible. But uh, if uh, there are mandatory prescription, we need uh, enforcement, control, sanction, and many other things. This is an administrative point uh, uh, of view. Second argument, uh, gender policy and language, a step too far, gender policy, traditionally are, uh, 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 have been uh, uh, carried out uh, via affirmative action programs, uh, which imply the possibility of limiting individual freedom and rights uh, to achieve anti-discriminatory objective via quota policies. Yes, but emerging gender policy use language as a tool for affirming another policy. And can language be coerced as a tool for policy? And we are at the same point of the last reasoning. What is prescriptivism in language? Prescriptivism is in the name of language uh, is present because we have academy, but is uh, contested. Uh, and there is descriptivism. And uh, prescriptivism in language, uh, standard language, uh, implies an idea of what is the best way to talk and imply an idea of a social choice, uh, which normally place uh, the standard in the higher class. But uh, there is also a new kind of prescriptivism in the name of other values. Uh, in this kind, the idea of gender policy. But if we look uh, at prescriptivism in language, uh, with language planning uh, and language enforcement in Italy, we go to national purist policy in fascism, with, uh, when a minority was limited in their language. And we go to the next uh, argument. Is question of language a question of thought? Uh, because law and language are institutions parallel, independent, but related. Language has its own rules and judges, uh, is incoercible, is so subtle to avoid legal restraints, uh, Samuel Johnson. Language and two are so deeply regulated that this is clear for linguistic psychology feminist studies that every attempt to restrict a language may result in limits for freedom of two, expression and speech. Fourth argument. Uh, why gender fail language and post gender fail language regulation have no ex ante assessment? They are meta regulation, rules about how regulating, because they define in many possible different ways standards about the way in which rules should be written. And we need a substantive evaluation of their impact. It would be necessary in the same way for any other regulation. So uh, affirmative action policies, when they use language, have to be carefully evaluated, have to carefully evaluate uh, by considering their costs and benefits, advantages and disadvantages, because uh, language, uh, if it's considered a coercible tool, and if law is considered a gender technology, we have probably to make uh, to pay too much uh, in terms uh, of the functioning of an indispensable infrastructure law which allow common life by limiting conflict. The conclusion is non-sexist drafting, not always in Italy, has achieved the objective of more clarity. In a grammatical language context, such as the Italian one, it should consider that the competition and the conflict between gender and post-gender solution, which is producing a plethora of artificial solution, and the debate is importing in the common language a sort of bubble effect. Regulation also at different level of government, especially at regional government, adopts a different conception and solution too. But the European Parliament remember that clarity, simplicity, precision and consistency say that not all solution which could, uh, uh, that could otherwise be applied can be used in the context of the legislation. The problem is the cultural, uh, as William uh, has uh, uh, already said. 
So the warning is language is free because it, it represents a constitutive aspect of individual freedom. While regulating, this should be very clear. Otherwise, enforcement may backfire and low risk to become less credible. And this is uh, the uh, uh, prevalent danger, the most dangerous things uh, in uh, this moment, uh, that uh, law is no longer capable to solve conflicts uh, by allowing an effective uh, and uh, cooperative uh, common life. And the plea, drafting should be cautious, especially in a context such as the Italian one. Uh, uh, one. So drafting, uh, from my perspective, should limit gender fairness to the consolidated prescription already adopted to the 19, in the 1990s. Use where possible per, uh, the, the uh, person as a general uh, word which uh, includes everybody, but without uh, too much division between the legal language and the common language by stressing a, a, a sort of a differentiation and a gap uh, between institution and citizens. Uh, it could be very dangerous. So apart from that, according to the logic of the zero option in impact assessment, drafting in Italy may probably do nothing. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, uh, your talk and uh, your comments, uh, uh, Anna, and your talk, Maria, uh, actually um, uh, are the, uh, the, the great examples of the, about the fact that this is a multi-layered uh, 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 topic uh, because it includes, uh, uh, of course, the main topic of the, the talk of today in the workshop, which is uh, law, uh, language, and gender. And whenever we talk about law, uh, we talk about legislative drafting, policies, uh, political decisions, power. And in this case, Italian and Spanish as well, laws, they and Welsh as well, because actually we have in these languages uh, a grammar, grammar language. And uh, for instance, in Italy, for no reason, the languages developed feminine and masculine for inanimate things. Uh, just an example, pasta, uh, which is a worldwide <laughs> name uh, known everywhere in the world, actually is feminine for no reason. And I can mention you other, other things. So for this reason, we have just, even in an inanimate things, uh, feminine and masculine. Of course, the situation becomes uh, much more complicated when we deal with the language of the law and the legislative drafting. And uh, uh, when Maria said something about um, how to deal with uh, new words uh, and uh, uh, in listening to uh, Thomas talk, I remembered a thing that happened a couple of years ago, if I'm not wrong, with the mayor of uh, uh, um, Rome, uh, La Sindaca Raggi, mayor Sin. We now we say sindaca. Actually, if you look up at this word in the dictionary, uh, the, the, the original word is sindaco. And the, for the very first time in the history of, as, I mean, as far as we know, she signed uh, a document uh, with the sindaca or something like that. Actually, it happens for the very first time in Italy, as far as we know, a problem with the, the correct legal uh, uh, construction Valid. language of a document. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, in Italy, uh, we have l'Accademia della Crusca, uh, which is an academy which uh, uh, overlook uh, 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 and on the development of language. But as you see, it's very, very uh, quite interesting how all the things are somehow uh, um, sold maybe or uh, uh, addressed in different countries. So, uh, actually, I can mention another, another thing that I came across uh, during my last research on uh, Italian language and legislative uh, uh, drafting and uh, European Union institutions. I mean, uh, 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 among the suggestions uh, addressed to uh, Italy specifically, there is to uh, try when uh, using name 
uh, that uh, indicate professions trying when it's possible to use the feminine or create a feminine form. And I came across this uh, avocata. And uh, uh, actually, oh my goodness, uh, yes, Maria uh, does in this way and agree with that, with, uh, with uh, uh, Maria. Uh, uh, actually, um, if you look up uh, uh, this word in the dictionary, and you will find that the very first meaning of avocata is uh, an attribute given to the Holy Mary in Italian language. And uh, um, actually, in the specialized dictionaries, avocata has a very small uh, space among the, uh, the meaning given to this masculine avocato. And uh, it is uh, written, yes, avocata from time to time is used in order to indicate an, uh, uh, a tone or uh, 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 who is a, a woman. And if you look uh, up at avocatessa, which uh, was uh, uh, formed, is a word which was formed, formed uh, a couple of years ago, maybe two decades ago, to indicate the female avocato, lawyer, tone, generally speaking. Nowadays, avocatessa uh, has a very negative connotation and indicate a very chatty woman. So uh, uh, the solution, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's very interesting because uh, it's not my, my case because I'm not a, a, an avocado, but sh what should I use in order to present myself, to be introduced, which title? It's quite interesting. The next speakers of today um, are uh, Francesca Rosati and uh, Francesca Vaccarelli. Francesca Rosati graduated in foreign languages and literature at the University of Laguna in 1993. Uh, she has been an associate professor of English linguistics and translation studies at the Faculty of Political Science, University of Teramo, since October 2001. Her studies embrace linguistics, domain specific English and word formation processes, in particular, and she has focused on the varieties of English multilingualism and language policies, as well as on African and Canadian literatures in English. The research and progress is on English loan words into Italian, a topic that she has already dealt with in various words. Francesca Vaccarelli is an Associate Professor of English Linguistics and Translation Studies at the Faculty of Communication Science, University of Teramo. Her research is mainly focused on English linguistics and lexicology, with formation processes, domain-specific Englishes, in particular business English, and English for political studies, English for tourism, English for biotechnology and EU terminology, and on anglicisms in the Italian language, specifically in the domains of economics, finance, and tourism. She has worked on varieties of English, especially in Ang Africa, Anglophone countries, and on the Euro English. More recent research idea uh, area deals with the terminology of legal and institutional languages. The research methodology is both quantitative and qualitative, making often use of corpus linguistics tools and is carried out in a synchronic and contrasting way. The title of the talk uh, uh, is Implementing Gender-Neutral Language in University Policies. The aim of the research is twofold. Firstly, they will outline the main lexical and grammatical features gender-neutral language shows in English. Secondly, they will collect a small corpus of university policy documents, recommendations and guidelines drawn from Anglophone universities to try to verify if such features of gender inclusive language are implemented in academic settings. Finally, they will make a comparison between two documents issued online by some Italian universities to find lexical and grammatical divergences and convergences between these two language systems. Thank you both, and the floor is yours. Good afternoon to you all, and thank you, Julia, for the chance you, gave, you have given us to take part in this interesting workshop and to go back to London, even if only virtually. We have decided to talk about some features of gender-neutral language in university settings. And uh, for this purpose, uh, we have split uh, this presentation into two parts. 
The first one deals with uh, the, the jury framework currently in force. And uh, uh, the second one, uh, where a corpus of document uh, will be analyzed, uh, compared, and uh, discussed in order to highlight uh, the de facto situation as far as inclusive policies uh, in some British, American, and Italian universities are concerned. Let's start by saying that uh, just in 2008, the European Parliament itself was among the first international organizations to adopt uh, multilingual uh, guidelines on gender neutral language. Such guidelines provide uh, practical advice uh, in all uh, the official and working languages on the use of gender fair and inclusive language. Since then, many other institutions and organizations have adopted similar guidance. Gender neutral or gender inclusive language is more than a matter of political correctness. Uh, rather, uh, language reflects and influences attitudes, behavior, and perceptions. Therefore, in order to treat all genders equally, efforts have been employed since the 1980s to propose a, a gender neutral use of language so that no gender is privileged and prejudices against any gender are not perpetuated. As part of those efforts, uh, several guidelines have been developed and implemented over the last decade at international and national level. International and European institutions, professional associations, uh, major news agencies and universities as well have adopted guidelines for the non-sexist use of language, either as separate documents or as specific recommendations included in their style guides. This, uh, this slide uh, um, shows uh, an excerpt from uh, the EU guidelines issued in uh, 2008 uh, under the title Gender Neutral Language in the European Parliament, where a definition and the main purpose of gender neutral language are given. In uh, 2019, uh, in the footsteps of such a document, uh, the UK's Office of the Parliamentary Council and the Government Legal Department issued their guide to gender neutral drafting for UK statutes and statutory instruments. While in June 2021, the National Health Service updated its language inclusive style guide. On the other hand, in the US, the House of Representatives approved the gender neutral language in the official House rules and established a permanent office of diversity and inclusion in January 2021. As far as uh, such an issue in Italy is concerned, uh, we can mention the guidelines uh, on generi e linguaggi in administrative and institutional context issued by the University of Turin in 2015, the guidelines issued by the University of Padua in 2017, and the handbook Scrivere con Sapienza, passed by the University Senate of Rome La Sapienza in 2021. Before delving into the practical investigation of the documents we collected, we can affirm that uh, in multilingual settings, the principles of gender neutrality in language and gender inclusive language require the use of different strategies uh, in uh, the various languages, uh, depending on the grammatical specificity of each of them. As far as grammatical gender is expressed in the official languages of the EU, for example, a distinction can be made between the three types of languages and the company strategies to achieve gender neutrality. Here we can, uh, um, the, 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 this slide show three groups. Uh, the first one uh, um, includes uh, the so-called the natural gender languages, uh, such as uh, English, Danish, and Sweden, where personal nouns are mostly gender neutral and there are personal pronouns specific for, his, for each gender. The general trend here is to reduce as much as possible the use of gender specific terms. So in those languages, the linguistic strategy, strategy most usually used 
is neutralization. The second group includes uh, uh, languages uh, uh, such as German, uh, Romance and Slavic languages, uh, the so-called grammatical gender languages, uh, where every noun has a grammatical gender and the gender of personal pronouns usually matches the reference noun. Feminization is the approach that has become increasingly used in these languages, uh, in particular in professional contexts, such as job titles when uh, referring to women. Of course, uh, feminization means uh, the use of feminine correspondence of masculine terms or the use of both terms. The third group includes uh, languages uh, such as Estonian, Finnish, and Hungarian, the so-called genderless languages, uh, where there is no grammatical gender and no pronominal gender. Now I'm going to pass the baton to my colleague who takes the floor in order to present you all the corpus collected and the analysis carried out. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Francesca, for giving me the floor and thank you, Julia, too. Uh, for um, this opportunity of sharing our research and viewpoints on this topic uh, with other scholars from uh, uh, legal and language studies. As Francesca has already pointed out, uh, I will analyze, I will give you a bird's eye view on a small corpus of university policy documents such as recommendations and guidelines drawn from Anglophone universities in order to highlight the de facto situation compared to the, the jury framework, that is to try to verify if such features on gender-inclusive language are implemented in academic settings. And our future aim is to make a comparison between the outcomes of this research with the data drawn, from, uh, drawn up from some Italian university, as uh, Francesco already mentioned before, to find lexical and grammatical divergences and convergences between these two language and legal systems. The starting point of uh, our considerations was an article issued last May on the CNN online edition, where Penn State University was said to remove binary gender language, such as freshmen and upper class men, from course and program descriptions, replacing them with first year and the upper positions division, sorry, respectively. Therefore, to focus on the language actually used in some British and American universities listed in this slide, we have collected documents referring to the behavior of such institutions in relation to gender inclusive language policies. And in particular, how we will see how to use pronouns in order to be as much inclusive and unbiased as possible. Let's start by observing the British universities here taken into account. The University of Oxford has a specific equality and uh, division unit, uh, also dealing with good practice in communication and constantly evolving language, uh, referring to face-to-face -face communication, on the phone communication, written communication, and the use of pronouns. Several universities have issued guidelines uh, on pronoun usage, for example, the University of Essex, as well as uh, other universities here explored, explored, encourages all staff and students to put their pronouns in their email signature or on their Zoom profile name. The definition given by the University of Plymouth in its pronouns explained file, pronouns are regarded as the words we use to refer to people's gender in conversation. For example, he or she. But uh, of course, not everyone identifies with the binary definitions of gender, male and female. So they may prefer gender neutral pronouns such as they, them, or they, they. Since someone's pronouns are not always obvious, 
they encourage staff and students to introduce themselves with theirs by introducing yourself with your pronouns or including them on email signatures. They help create a more inclusive campus by not making assumptions on someone's gender identity based on their appearance or name. Often, they can be used as a singular pronoun, but using they or them as a singular is nothing new at all, because we may find it used in texts such as the Canterbury Tales, Shakespeare, Hamlet, and even the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights. Uh, moreover, the singular use of they was the linguistic society of America's word of the decade in 2022. The University of Exeter, in its pronounced at work guidance, suggests using generically other gender neutral language, such as colleagues, students, team members, participants, if we do not know which pronoun to use properly. And the University of Warwick, in its handout entitled Pronouns, let's, let's get it right, lists six ideas for getting pronouns right, as you can see in this slide. For example, when you introduce someone, use their pronouns so others will learn them, or consider including pronouns in your email signature, as we said before. Also, the University of St. Andrews in Scotland has faced the gender issues in language use. In March 2020, the Proctor asked a group of staff and students to work together on developing a guidance document for the university community related to the use of pronouns. The group decided to focus on two outputs, a short guidance document for staff and students outlining a suggested approach for, to using pronouns and an accompanying video. Such a guidance has been recently issued in February 2021, and it seeks to explain some of the concepts around pronoun use and to help students and staff develop practice that contributes to creating an inclusive environment for all members of the St. Andrews community. It also calls uh, the attention to the fact that deliberate misgendering could be considered harassment under the Equality Act 2010. Uh, among the steps taken by the university to implement gender-inclusive policies through language, when applying for a position at the university, there are a selection of titles uh, to choose, including MEX, that is a, a new title also recorded in the Oxford English Dictionary, and the chance to write in an alternative. Under another perspective, that is the teaching one, the Department of Languages and Cultures at the Lancaster University hosted a workshop on gender inclusive language in the language classroom. The aim of the workshop were twofold, to introduce participants to current debates about and, and approaches to gender inclusive language in Chinese, French, German, Italian, and Spanish-speaking societies, and to discuss implications for the teaching and assessment practices in modern foreign languages to share practice and recommendations. Let's pass to the American context. Here we have considered, for example, the documents delivered by the Vanderbilt University in Nashville, where the faculty senate, with support from the Vanderbilt student government and trans and non-binary students on campus, worked to develop resources to give guidance on gender inclusivity in the classroom. In addition, the Vanderbilt English Language Center created a detailed eight-page pronoun guide, including also gender bias and apology exercises, as part of its mission to address the professional, academic, and practical language needs of students who have a first language other than English. We can see here a slide, um, a, a sort of a guideline on how to um, behave uh, related to pronouns. 
The University of Wisconsin in Madison released a leaflet on gender pronoun guides as a starting point for using pronoun respectfully. And the Northeastern University in Boston features a special section on its website focusing on university equity and compliance, where a gender identity and personal pronouns with syllabus guidance is present to help create a safer and more inclusive classroom experience for transgender and non-binary students during lectures. The American University Guide on Pronouns gives some examples of name tags, office name plates, and business cards showing pronouns. And this is the slide in the slide uh, in this example. Okay, so we can see um, pronouns he, him, his. Okay. Finally, an article published in February 2020 on the New York, New York Times outlined the new gender language policies and the steps for word good in practice by the well-known Harvard University, where during the orientation day, students carried a name placard for, from class to class so their professors could easily call on them. Despite its reputation as a bastion of the establishment, the Kennedy School followed the student's lead, agreeing to provide a clear plastic stickers last semester with four pronoun options that students could apply to their name cards. He, him, she, her, they, them, and Z, here. Therefore, as we have underlined, many, university, many universities have made gender pronoun protocols voluntary. They are generally considered best practices, just recommendations, not requirements, not mandatory rules. For example, some colleges suggest that professors introduce themselves by their pronouns on the first day of class as a kind of bonding exercise and an implicit invitation for students to volunteer their own pronouns. Professors say they feel strong pressure to comply and fear receiving bad students' ratings if they don't. In conclusion, we can affirm that several steps have been taken in university settings from a regulatory and prescriptive point of view both in the British and in American universities here highlighted. Over our investigation, we have observed that efforts have been devoted to implement general rules on non-discriminatory language in academic policies. This can be considered as a trend towards a more inclusive and respectful, respectful language, a tool to bridge and overcome the barriers of sex, gender, and sexuality in addition to the already and partly regulated areas where discrimination has occurred over time, for example, age, mental health, race, ethnicity, religion, nationality, does, as we have already said uh, this morning, and we stress now, the role of language cannot be underestimated since it can actually aid to move forward a more inclusively sustainable society. Thank you for your attention. Thank you both, Francesca. <laughs> Francesca, we, we change position. We change position. Oh, uh, in Italian language. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, uh, you all, for uh, this very interesting. Uh, 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 and uh, highlights uh, on uh, uh, actually very different topics, but all of them related to uh, gender language and uh, specifically to English language. Mm, from the point of view of the uh, talk of uh, Francesca Vaccarelli and Francesca Rosati, this is quite interesting topic, actually. And uh, uh, I don't think that Italian universities... Uh, have uh, so far dealt with with this uh, with these problems. Actually, the very first uh, thing that, uh, which I read related to uh, the um, fair gender use of pronouns within uh, the U.S. context so was uh, uh, um, uh, related to 2000, uh, uh, 2001, 2002 or something like that. So quite early uh, before. Uh, then uh, the topic 
now, nowadays is quite, quite current in many universities. And I remember that uh, uh, this uh, way of specifying uh, um, uh, new pronouns, uh, they, I remember that there was a university in the south of the United States who uh, eventually proposed a new kind of uh, pronouns that uh, freshmen or <laughs> uh, first year course students uh, should choose uh, uh, before uh, starting uh, uh, the subjects and the courses, so before attending courses, and to send this uh, 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 way of being identified somehow to the professors. Uh, so it was quite interesting, uh, though. Um, however, uh, uh, um, I'm sure that uh, uh, in, in Italy, this problem should be dealt from a different perspective, different point of view. Uh, because uh, again, we have uh, a coordination and uh, as soon as we choose a pronoun, we have to, to coordinate and to harmonize all the other words. So if you choose a sua, you should say studentessa. If you choose a suo, studente. Uh, so we there is almost no choice in terms of this binary uh, distinction. So thank you so much for this very enlightening uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, um, view of the panorama that we have among the universities. Thanks. And the first speaker of this uh, second uh, subsection is uh, uh, Anna Maradas Butch. She is an associate professor of constitutional law at the University of Valencia, Spain, School of Law, and she is the director of the Chair of Feminist Economy. She received a doctoral degree in law from the University of Valencia, and she has carried out research studies at the University of Pisa, Italy, Virginia, Kent, and the University of London and the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, and has held seminars at the University of Kent, the University of Bologna. She is specialist in gender studies, has participated in several research projects about these areas, and has published most of the studies in the field of political participation, gender violence, labor, uh, labor discrimination, and maternity. And last works are about the constitutional reform in Spain, especially related to the language of the constitution with gender perspective. And she is a member of the Consejo Valenciano de la Mujer, which depends on the Generalitat Valenciana and a member of the Feminist Net of Constitutional Law. The title of her talk uh, this afternoon is Language with Gender Perspective in the Spanish Constitutional Framework. The use of the generic male or the use of the masculine to designate the universal is one of the most serious problems in Spanish language that perpetuates the own values of the patriarchal culture and restrains progress towards real equality. It is a tradition unique to Romantic languages, such as Spanish, that reflects once again the strength of patriarchal culture and society that banished women from the spectrum of social, legal, political, and cultural domains, and it makes them not be represented. Therefore, it is necessary to accomplish the revision of the constitutional and legal framework in which, in parallel with the recognition and guarantee of an equal representation, women are made visible as autonomous subjects language. Thank you, Anna. The floor is yours. Thank you, Julia. Thank you very much for your kind presentation. And uh, I would like to, to thank you for the organization of this seminar and um, as well for your kind invitation, playing into the constitutional framework. And I will explain to you um, a real case that we have um, just um, ha, in, um, in, in Spain um, and a report that we have prepared for that. Uh, I remember at, at that moment, two years ago, in July 2019, that the vice president of the Spanish government asked the Royal Spanish Academy of the Language uh, to write a report about the use of the um, inclusive language and non-sexist language in case of um, or in case a constitutional reform took place. 
I told you at that time that next time that it was going to be in 2020, but as we know, this terrible pandemic uh, forced us to postpone the, the seminar for, the, for this year. I told you then that next time I would bring the, the content of the report uh, performed by um, the, the Royal Academy of, of the Language in, in Spain. Although I already knew um, what they were going to say. Uh, and I guessed correctly because they have always said the same argument. They consider that the masculine is omnicomprehensive of both men and women. So because it is universal, there is no need to use both genders all the time, or there is no use to think of um, a language in feminine to show, to name women. Um, on the opposite, <laughs> a feminist academic or academic feminism is or has always been against this argument because these form part of the patriarchal mechanisms of exclusion of women because they are not represented through language. Um, <clears throat> I am sorry because I didn't bring a, a, pres a presentation with me. So I will try to, to read so that um, I can express everything much better according to the things that I have written. The, the use of the generic male or the use of masculine to designate both men and women, as uh, Julia has just read from my, the, the, the abstract of my presentation, is one of the most serious problems in the Spanish language and um, that perpetuates the own values of the patriarchal culture and restrains progress to equality or towards real equality. It is uh, a tradition um, which is unique to Romanic languages such as Spanish and others, as, as we know, that reflects once again the strength of patriarchal culture and society that banishes women from the spectrum of social, legal, political, cultural spheres. And it makes them not feel represented because what is not named does not appear, um, simply does not exist. Although any references to the male gender could be considered um, to be inclusive with female. Uh, Professor Marisa Calero, who is one of the most um, important linguists and experts in this field, explains um, that since school, we have been indoctrinated that the Spanish term Men defines all mankind. That is the, the origin of the problem. Men and women. In the case of the Spanish language, as in the case of other languages derived from Indo-European, as we know, we have been talking this morning, uh, French, Italian, etc. Male gender is just de facto with um, a supposedly generic and universal value against the female which is reduced in its use to exceptional cases, what in linguistics is called with the label of gender marking. And, and this is how it works in these languages. But the, the words that designate the male are not really inclusive of the, femini, um, of the feminine because what actually happens in the discourse from a critical standpoint is that the male always 
overrides. It is used instead of the feminine. It is obvious then that one of the most serious problems is in, in, in Spanish language uh, for real equality is the use of masculine to designate the universal, say, uh, as I have said. So the solution to this problem can come through several resources, several techniques, as we have been talking this, this morning. And many of the proposals that uh, our colleagues have put on the table are shared uh, by um, our linguistics and other uh, our academics as well in the same sense. The use of the inclusive binomials, um, that is to say, the, the the use of both words. Because when you, it's like when you say in English, um, ladies and gentlemen, you have two words. However, we have we. We must say señores y señoras. So we have to use the same word, but in both genders. Uh, as well, the unfolding of the grammatical genders, the use of the generic or the collective nouns where possible. Also, the use of the word person, that I, I personally consider, um, well, it is my favorite one because it is quite neutral. In, in the sense of omni, or to be omnicomprehensive of everybody. And also the use of some pronouns um, and relatives, generic as well. But in the face of those who despise the use of inclusive binomials and all these techniques for breaking the tradition of Spanish language, it is necessary to emphasize that even this argument is not valid because uh, historically these techniques uh, have already been used in um, classical literature and also in legal language. In communicative acts, the male form of nouns, adjectives and other determinants in their use as a generic can set a semantic trap to the recipient of the message, who, to the person who receives the, the message. Because the male categorical gender creates in our minds the idea of masculine, hmm? the idea of male human beings. However, the use of the feminine, the, the, the gender, in feminine, um, also creates the idea um, of, women, of women, and we are making them visible um, through this technique. Women, since the beginning of um, 20th, uh, the 20th century, have been obtaining citizenship rights whose achievement was unthinkable just um, years ago, thanks to the struggles, um, the battles waged by many uh, feminists, uh, the pioneers of feminism. And the recent visibility of women has led to revolutionary changes in um, the different fields, uh, legal, legislative area, um, you know, labor, political, uh, social, cultural, but still the language. This should be as well another another field to to um, use with this uh, perspective. Social developments influence language. Uh, Extra linguistic factors are an important driver in the evolution suffered by all languages. According to these theories, defenders of the existence of a close link between language and thought, languages influence the mentality and the feelings of the speaking community. Um, I would like to connect this with the idea that we have been talking about this morning um, from the, the intervention uh, made by Maria, um, she was uh, a little bit uh, uh, maybe 
well, not scared, but let's let's uh, use this as a as a term. Uh, explaining that um, maybe language um, shouldn't be forced to change, and this could be more uh, progressive and uh, an evolution. But the thing is that after many centuries, language um, has had an important influence in culture and society and has contributed to the consolidation of the patriarchal culture. So now we could say um, that we could use language with another purpose, with a much equalitarian and balanced purpose, which is to use language um, to create, to build um, society more respectful with equality rights. In the Spanish state, although with some delight from other Western countries, proposals have been launched uh, in order to strip the common uh, Spanish language and the other co-official language. As we, as you know, we have many co-official languages in, in Spain uh, of the sex sexism that permeates them. And the authors who propose such changes agree on the idea that it is necessary to make a particular progress in the feminization of the lexicon of languages, as well as in some specific aspects of the morphological level with the aim of naming and giving existence to women. The male subject, um, also in the Spanish society, appears at the center of the discourse. Women are also protected by the constitution, of course, but uh, through language, you cannot see this. They are not visible because our language, our languages, the ones that we, we sh share um, with this marked gender characteristic, uh, are really strong with, uh, with the use of the masculine. So women are displaced from the spirit and the letter of the covenant. In this way, not only solid patriarchal legal structures are extended, but collective conceptions about male supremacy continue to be built. Therefore, to speak of the legal language is to speak of who exercises power and how the power, how power is exercised. That is why incorporating women, not only into power, but also in language, involves making them present which has not only a material dimension, but also a symbolic dimension, apart from other important achievements. I would like to, as I said, to present you a real case. Uh, it is about a professional association of engineers in Spain. Uh, this uh, professional association uh, has a Committee for Equality, which is integrated by female, uh, mostly by female engineers. Mm -hmm. And they wanted us, uh, when I say us, I'm referring to Alba Soriano, who is the, the one, the, the colleague who is um, talking at the end of the, of the seminar, uh, and me to perform a report um, in order they have solid arguments, legal solid arguments, uh, to be able to change the name. They wanted to change the name in order to have a more inclusive term instead of um, being the professional association of engineers, male engineers, because, because you have to think that uh, when we say engineers in Spanish, we say ingenieros, and that is masculine, the women uh, don't feel represented. Hmm? And that's why they wanted to change this name into 
Professional Association of Engineering. Not even female. They didn't want to have the feminine in the name. They only wanted to have a omnicomprehensive term, an inclusive term, which was in Spanish would be ingeniería, hmm? engineering, which is perfect. So nothing bad about that. But yes, it was bad. Uh, men didn't want that because they said that was a tradition. So <laughs> they wanted uh, to um, get an assembly mm, to call for a general assembly to vote for that proposal because they knew that they are the majority, so they would get a no instead of a yes. So they would get more uh, votes against the proposal than in favor. That's why they wanted to call for a general assembly. Uh, but uh, the committee integrated by women didn't want to go to the election, to the, to the, um, to the voting, because they knew that men would uh, obtain more no's against it. So they wanted a report with solid arguments in favor of the direct substitution of the name, just to change the name. Um, and they, they told us, is that, that we are we asking that much? I mean, it, is it too much to ask for a, for a neutral and general, not even a feminine name? We just want a, a general, uh, omnicomprehensive name. But because we know that we are talking in terms of uh, law and in terms of uh, legal requirements, so we must be very careful because this is not just an academic theory that we can produce, but we have to be very close to the legal framework. Uh, so we um, explain it and we made a report in, the, in this way that um, I will explain. Well, um, the question is whether professional associations are legally mandated to change their names in order to use truly neutral denominations. In Spain, there are some that have been changing. For example, the um, Professional Association of Doctors, because we say medicos, um, <laughs> we have also the feminine, or also the uh, asso uh, Professional Association of Lawyers uh, or Barristers. We have abogado, abogada, uh, but we have a generally inclusive term that is very convenient, which is abogacía. So instead of using the profession in masculine or feminine, we may use the general term. So abogacía, medicina, so medicine, um, studies or law expert. I don't know in English how it would be, but in Spanish, it is easy to do it. So in Spain, professional associations as public law corporations that form part of the so-called corporate administration are associative entities to which the law assigns a series of tasks of public interest for the achievement of which it attributes certain public powers in the exercise of which they are governed by administrative law. This is not intended to deny the partially private nature of professional associations because they share a uh, double nature. On the one hand, they share some functions uh, and characteristics of the administrative law, so the public law, but on the other hand, they have a private nature because they are um, professional associations. As they are also partially governed by the rules of private law in the exercise of some of the functions entrusted to them. However, 
to the extent that professional associations exercise public powers, it is necessary that their name also complies with the requirements applicable to public administrations in terms of inclusive language. Insofar as this institution carry out actions of public administrations, this is the legal trick that we used, the name they use in the exercise of these public powers must necessarily respect and reflect the basic principles and criteria of action of public authorities. We have in Spain a very important act of, of equality, which is the, the Organic Act of e uh, Equality of Men and Women, that establishes the implementation of non-sexist language in the administrative sphere as one of the general criteria for action by public authorities. In this sense, since the enactment of this regulation, a significant number of linguistic guides have been published in the sphere of public administrations aimed at combating sexist uses of language. These guides recommended avoiding the use of generic masculine. So this is one of the lines that we followed. For their part, the equality regulations passed by the different autonomous communities in Spain, you know that uh, Spain is organized according to the territory to different regions that are called uh, autonomous communities or self-governing communities. And they have um, also their own acts. They have equality acts as well. And many of their articles um, recommend the use of non-sexist language. For example, the, the Equality Act of Andalusia, um, which is a, an act for the promotion of equality, referring to governing or collegiate bodies and names of Andalusian professional associations and public law corporations, establishes that. The entities referred to in this article must adapt their names to a non-sexist use of language. So we've got it. All in all, the current legal framework and social context recognizes and establishes the need of, to use language that does not exclude or make women invisible, especially in the context of the actions of public administrations. Insofar as the professional association of civil engineers exercises functions inherent to public administrations, such as the exercise of sanctioning powers or the organization of the civil engineering profession, and that in the exercise of these functions, it issues resolution. Sorry, um, Anna, last minute. <laughs> it issues resolution subject to the uh, rules of administrative law. It is difficult to argue that the appearance in these decisions of the current name of the professional association of civil engineers in the sense of male engineers, ingenieros, ended in with O, so masculine, does not uh, violate the applicable rules on equality and specifically on the use of inclusive language. So it is very difficult to to maintain that this is not a violation of the right to equality. And that's why um, we propose the name, the substitution of the name into a more inclusive uh, one. So we send the report to the female engineers. So the, this committee for equality integrated mostly by women. And let's see what happens. We are waiting for the results of the decision of the executive of the body. But in the meantime, I have to say, and this is my conclusion for this, that the minister, the, the minister whom they depend on, I mean, um, each uh, professional association depends on a different ministry. For example, the um, professional associations of lawyers depends on the justice ministry. Um, but this uh, association of engineers depends on the... Um, how can I say? I don't know the name in English. Infrastructuras is. Can you help me, Julia? It's like I don't know the public. Um, 
Ida Samara. Ida Samara, the minister whom they depend on, uh, has already made declarations um, referring to the collective in bo using both genders, in masculine and feminine. So maybe because the minister, who is the boss, the commander in chief of the, the rest of the, of the associations, uh, because he has been using both uh, genders or the, the name with the both genders, because he has been saying uh, male engineers and uh, uh, female engineers, maybe um, this could be um, an important uh, step for the consecution of, and for the achievement of equality in this uh, area. And thank you very much. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, your very interesting presentation uh, once again shows that uh, um, a, a gender neutral fair representation of male and women uh, actually goes hand uh, in hand with uh, political decisions, uh, power, and of course, culture. Culture related to the specific context, of course. Well, uh, again, as we did in the first session uh, uh, this afternoon, uh, for any questions, comments uh, to be addressed to the first speaker, we should wait for uh, the end of the session. Then we will have, um, I mean, uh, uh, some time to, to, to talk about questions and comments. So let's move on. Thank you, Anna. And let me introduce the second speaker of today. Uh, Karin Gilbert, well, welcome Karin. Uh, she is an associate professor at Paris Nanta University and head of international and European law office at the French Ministry of Economy and Finance. She's approached the public law and administrative justice as an academic, but also in a position to the French Ministry of Justice and since 2020 at the French Ministry of Economy and Finance. In, um, as from 2003 and 2020, 2018, she worked for the French Ministry of Justice in high-level positions, which included being an advisor to the minister and heading up several departments. She had been the French representative to the CPEJ, Council of Europe, for eight years, and to the EU Justice Scoreboard, as well as the representative of France in the European Commission Rule of Law, Working Group and OECD Working Group on Access to Justice. She has developed research seminars and training programs in order to support lawyers, national authorities and officials in the design and implementation of regulatory policy in the field of justice and the rule of law. Since 2009, she has been regularly solicited by large international organizations to support legislative processes, justice reforms, and expose evaluation of those reforms. She was the team leader of an European project on the evaluation of the quality of justice systems in the European Member States in 2015-2017. Uh, the title of the talk is From Gender Balance to Gender Neutral Legislative Drafting Style, The French Case. Thank you, Karen. The floor is yours. <laughs> Sorry, I have a problem with the the sound. Yes, we can hear you. Sorry, uh, is it better? Yes. Um, so thank you for for the invitation. Um, I am very pleased to be with such distinguished colleagues uh, specialized in linguistics, which I'm not. <laughs> uh, and I will uh, discuss or present the, the French case uh, and, and gender uh, neutrality and gender balance in legislative drafting. 
Um, so to, I have, I, I would like to share something with you. Oops, so let me see, I think that's it. I hope you can see it. Yes, yes. Okay, good. Uh, so this is the title of um, a book um, which was published in 2018. Uh, and, and the title of the book is um, uh, Here's the Ministry Pregnant. Uh, of course, in, 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 in English, it makes, no, it makes no sense. But in French, um, the, the question is, could a minister really, really be pregnant? Because minister in France, is a masculine uh, term and um, the, the question was is this a question or an issue for medicine or is it a linguistic issue and this was the argument of Mr. Serquini uh, and, and the book was quite uh, seminal. Um, in France um, the, the question was uh, should we say la ministre when it's a woman or should we say le ministre uh, even though it is, uh, she is uh, a, a woman? So the, the subtitle of the book is uh, the, the big fight over feminization of nouns. And, and this is really uh, the, some kind of a, issue for um, public authorities um, to have this gender balance uh, drafting style, not only in legislation, but also in all public decisions. So for a long time, lawyers uh, has, have considered that they were not concerned by the, the debate. Because in the French legal tradition, statute law is expressed, that's what they say, in a neutral legislative drafting style. And what is called the, the Conseil d'État style, uh, the, the, this is the high council uh, for administrative um, matters. Uh, and it, it's also the, the council for, for the government on, on legislative drafting. So neutrality was uh, at the very heart of legislative drafting quality, meaning that uh, as um, uh, my colleague from Spain just mentioned, because there are many similarities with your uh, presentation and, and your issues in, in Spain. Um, neutrality was the expression of universality and equality before the law. And we say uh, in, in French law that there is a passion for equality and universality. This is well known, not, not only in France, but I think uh, worldwide that French has this passion for equality and universality. But sometimes it is misleading because um, the neutrality is not a real neutrality, and I will explain why. why. In, in the French tradition, um, the neutral expression of legislative uh, provision is a core co component of the legislative drafting style. It means that legislative provisions are expressed in uh, general terms, uh, it is abstract by nature, the, the, the way uh, the legislation is drafted is abstract, and its expression should be general and what we say impersonnel, which means that uh, statute law shouldn't target a specific individual of, or group of individuals. Uh, it means that you cannot target Mr. or Mrs. X um, in, in a specific uh, statute law. 
Um, so it means that statute law should only formulate um, principles and rules that are general and that are general enough to cover all situations in their diversity as long as those situations are clearly defined or identified by clear criteria. So in this approach, uh, general DT is meant to ensure an equal treatment of individuals because individuals placed in equal situations should be uh, treated equally. Um, and it is the, 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 the work of the judge or public authorities uh, to implement the law, those general principles to individual situations. This is, of course, um, um, linked to universality, but along the way, uh, French authorities and, and citizens and uh, representatives uh, in, in the parliament and, and lawyers themselves um, came to the conclusion that maybe uh, this general drafting style was not enough to, um, to, to, to make the situation of men and women equal. So it means that this general uh, way of drafting was not um, in favor of, of the women's rights. Um, of course, uh, we, we can find uh, in, in the literature, in the legal literature, some comments on, on the problems of generality. And I um, just, uh, when I was doing some research for this presentation, I found this um, statement from uh, a prominent uh, scholar, uh, a French scholar, legal scholar, um, in, in a, um, a paper called La Règle comme modèle. Um, and, and this uh, scholar uh, stated that generality meant that legislative rules shouldn't be different on the grounds of ethnic or social origins or geographical situation. It means that there shouldn't be no specific regimes for uh, based on these grounds, which is quite um, uh, usual in, 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 uh, the, in, in the law or in international law even. But uh, when we read further this paper, that this um, uh, scholar uh, continues saying that there may be some objective differences. And one of these objective differences is the age when the person is um, has fr from the difference uh, based on the age and the sex of the person, which is quite interesting. Um, and the, 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 the scholar, I, sh I should say, um, adds, this was the, the prevalent uh, conception for a long time. And this article, uh, this, this paper was issued in 1990, which is quite recent, obviously. In practice, um, Maybe the, the situation is more complex. I mean, um, if we take the neutral legislative drafting style, there is, of course, this difficult process towards uh, gender and the neutral legislative drafting style. But uh, maybe the, the French legislation is moving towards a more substantial approach to gender equality, which could be uh, interesting, of course. So the, the, the neutrality of the legislative drafting style is, is an apparent neutrality um, regarding the, the gender uh, neutrality. 
If we uh, take some examples, um, in Article 7 of the Civil Code, it is stated that the exercise of civil rights um, is independent from the exercise of political rights, etc. So this is really how the French law is expressing generality and how the, the, the civil code especially is um, formulating the, the principle, um, the, the legal uh, principles uh, regarding civil and political rights, but all rights. What is interesting, if we move on uh, in, in the civil code, uh, but in, in, in French law in general, you may see that um, neutrality is um, expressed by some linguistic mark markers or marks of generality. And in these markers, you can find here um, tout français jouira des droits civils, which means approximately because this is my translation. So uh, any French citizen will benefit from civil rights. So in French, you have um, these markers of uh, generality uh, expressed by two, by un, which means one. Uh, and I will come back to, to this example later, or by quiconque, which means anyone. Um, so you have these uh, general uh, markers, linguistic markers, and um, you can uh, sort them uh, in three categories. You have the affirmative um, uh, linguistic markers of generality, which means to or anyone, everyone, any French citizen, any act, etc. And in this affirmative marker, you have also chacun. So you are trying to target someone, um, but it's everyone. So for instance, heavy, everyone has a right to private life. And in French, you say chacun. Um, you have the what we call the negative uh, linguistic markers of generality, which is nul, which means uh, in, in English is maybe translated by no one. And then you have indefinite pronouns, mm, uh, which could be translated by one or we. Oui. And you have also autrui, which means others. But here you can say, oh, okay, this is general enough and you can cover both uh, categories. Uh, men and women are included in those markers. But if you take the, 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 the French language, if you say, Tout Français jouira des droits civils. So all French citizens will benefit from civil rights. You could also say Toute Française, which means uh, the, the women, the, the French women. And here you have the general masculine, the, the one that you were mentioning before for Spain. I think this is quite similar to, to the Spanish case. So you could say uh, toute française and tout français. Uh, so here we can say that maybe the, the, the neutral legislative drafting style is not that neutral, which is quite interesting. Um, if you take, um, conversely, if you take quiconque, on, ou, or autrui, these are really uh, neutral. Uh, expression. There, there is no feminine form of, of these um, uh, uh, terms. Um, so even though um, the, the, the markers uh, are the one of neutrality, most of the terms that are used as neutral 
are not really neutral uh, regarding the, the gender. They are not gender neutral. The, the, you have a, a masculine and feminine um, um, form of, of uh, these terms in French. And the, the, there is um, a, an interesting and seminal book uh, as well that was uh, published in 2014. Um, the, the title of the book is No, the masculine won't prevail over the feminine. Uh, in, in the French language. And in this book, uh, Eliane Viennot um, made the, the demonstration that um, back in the uh, 17th century, the masculine form was not prevailing over the feminine form. And it's just from this um, 17th century and on, that, uh, that, that there has been a masculinization of the, the French uh, grammar uh, and the French uh, terms. Um, so proponents of a more gender neutral legislative drafting style argue that by nature, the terms used in French law, but in French in general, are not gender neutral and they are proposing to move towards inclusive writing. And I will explain in, in a while what is inclusive writing. Um, so I will skip. So the idea is to move from this apparent neutrality of legislative drafting style to a more substantial approach to not gender neutrality, but gender equality in uh, legislative drafting style. And here th there is uh, a vibrant debate uh, in, in the, the, the French law um, that may be started in, in the early 2000s, um, specifically in, in, the in 1999. Because um, the prime minister issued then um, some instructions uh, to to the, the public administrations, and um, this uh, debate uh, is not over yet. Uh, I mean, the, the 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 question is still vibrant, and and this is really uh, hot. Topic in, in in the French um, um, public um, in, in 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 the French public opinion. Um, so the the idea was uh, either to have inclusive writing or to have a feminization of legal drafting, which is a little bit different. Uh, and I will uh, show some example uh, from from the, the French uh, perspective. So in uh, 2017, uh, the prime minister once again uh, issued um, an instruction to, to the public administration uh, to feminine, feminine, to the feminization, to go to, to promote the feminization or to impose the feminization uh, in the drafting of all legal texts that are published in the official uh, Gazette in France, the, the official uh, journal, uh, the French official journal. And what is interesting, um, the objective of the instruction is to combat uh, stereotypes on the ground of gender. So sexist uh, stereotypes and to promote gender equality. But uh, in, in this instruction, the masculine, in, the masculine in form uh, stays the, the neutral form. So I mean, the generic terms um, is still uh, prevalent in, in the French uh, system. The, the, the French legislative drafting. Feminization is only or is applied 
she uh, title um, first for high ranking positions and for job profile to avoid uh, the, the problem of uh, gender inequality uh, in in job interviews um, or um, the, the, the the women may may uh, not apply to a job because it is uh, written in masculine in form. Um, but the, the use of inclusive writing is banned. So it means in this instruction, public administration are not authorized to use uh, the, the, the inclusive writing. What do we mean by inclu inclusive by writing? I should explain because, oops, sorry. Otherwise, you, you may be mistaken. Um, so up, I will move on. So what we mean by um, uh, inclusive writing is uh, to change the form uh, of the, the French um, graphie, the, the way we, we, we are formulating some terms that are um, originally uh, in, in masculine in, uh, form. It means we say an ingénieur. Uh, and before we were not saying une ingénieur. Uh, there was no uh, she as an engineer. Uh, they, they were he. Right? And if you were an engineer and a woman, because these uh, women exist, and, and there are many of engineers that are women engineers, um, you will be called an ingénieur and, and not an une ingénieur. Um, so the idea was when, uh, when the word um, is in, in, in its masculine form and feminine form is quite uh, similar, uh, that you add a medium, medium, uh, medium full point here. I, I don't know if you can see it. So you you um, draft it uh, ingénieur dot e s, which is the the, the feminization of ingénieur. So you have ingénieur uh, men and engineer women. And you have uh, historian, um, uh, uh, historian and historian, in the same thing. Um, and, and for the feminine and masculine in term, if you want to use them both, if you want to say he or she, um, you say she because before, because it's in alphabetical order. So there is no fight over uh, this between men and women. Uh, she is the first because she is the first in the alphabet, in French, at least. Um, and if you say tous les Acadiens and tous les Acadiennes, you say tous because Acadien uh, in, in its masculine in form is first in the alphabet. And you say celle et ce because this is the same idea. So uh, the, the, the Ministry of um, Education, National Education, issued. Uh, Karine, sorry, La the last minute. Okay, the last minute, I promise. Um, so the, the Ministry of uh, National Education issued the manual for inclusive writing, and here you can see uh, what um, we are going uh, towards the, 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 the different uh, situation that we may encounter, because inclusive writing is quite difficult in French if you, if you choose the, the median point. So um, there, um, has, there has been a proposition of law 
um, over the the use of inclusive writing. And I should maybe this would be a deception to you because we are still at the stuck at the same point. Uh, this bill is proposing to ban and even criminalize the use of inclusive writing uh, when this inclusive writing is used by public administration, uh, by entities in charge of a service of general interest, public service, or entities which benefit from public subsidies. You can imagine this is this is quite a far right MP's proposition. So this is a proposition for the far from the far right MPs. So there is no chance um, that that it will um, become a law uh, ever. So the, the 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 movement now is more going towards uh, a more um, gender equality and for instance and just to conclude uh, we had this small baby step but this is not um, uh, um, something that is uh, not significant uh, in 2014 um, we abolished or we replaced the notion of bonus pater familias which is the bon père de famille the the good father of the family, I don't know the, 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 the wording in English, by the term reasonable person. It means we, um, we replace the notion, which is clearly a patri patriarchal um, notion by a more neutral notion, which is a reasonable person. Also because bonus pater familias could be at that time, the women, which is quite interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Karin. Very illuminating uh, talk on the French context, actually. And uh, I think, and, and I would be very brief, because we have to move on with the other speakers, questions at the end of the last one um, of this session. Actually, I think that you raised an important aspect that all of us have to think about, uh, and uh, we mentioned this this morning, actually the importance to uh, consider the context. And uh, 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 not only the cultural one, but also the context within the legal domain. So, uh, uh, and how to adjust the language according to the context. Actually. So, so very interesting, very good. So let's move on quickly. Again, questions and uh, comments at the end of the last speaker of today. And uh, let me introduce the next speaker. She's, uh, thank you, Kai, uh, is uh, Elena castellano Tula. Uh, she is PhD candidate and junior researcher at the University of Valencia. She holds a BA in translation and intercultural mediation, as well as an MA in creative uh, translation both from the University of Valencia. In 2018, she obtained a three-year pre-doctoral fellowship at the English and German department granted by the Valencian government. And she has acted as secretary of the Valencia Napoli Colloquium on gender and translation and published a number of works on the intersection between gender and language and gender and translation across different genres and text types. The title of her presentation this afternoon is Institutional Misnome Translations of Grammatical Gender Asymmetries, the Canadian Experience. Institutional discourse has the power to build identities so through the regulation of social life. By enacting the rules governing different communities, will it force legislators to identify and classify legal subjects whose discursive misrepresentations condition the administration of justice. This is the case for women who have found in legal settings a transnational space for cooperation and dialogue. Quebec and France initially nurturing each other's feminisms illustrated that such feminist transnational debates can be oppositional and changing. Although both regions have interestingly discussed this matter in institutional debates, 
they will focus on Quebec's receptiveness and its transnational approach to the new role of the Latvian Thank you, Helena. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, um, can you hear me well? Yes, okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me. Indeed, I have to thank, first of all, Dr. Maraves, who actually uh, suggested me to participate. I think it has been quite, quite enriching, a uh, very productive day. And yeah, this morning has been quite, quite uh, illustrative for me. Indeed, I will make some connections with some things, some things that have already been said, or I think have been very clearly uh, they have been very clearly illustrated by others. So, um, yeah, that will also help me stick with the time frame that we have. Okay, um, let's start with the presentation. Um, okay. Okay, yes, yeah, so you can see now my, my presentation, um, my PPT. Um, yeah, okay. Now, uh, okay, sorry, this now, okay, yeah, okay, um, perfect. So that was the title that has been presented, Institutional Translations, Mistranslations and Non-Translations of Grammatical Gender Symmetries. And in particular, I'm going to discuss the Canadian experience, which is the, the one that I know best uh, after uh, my studies there and some, some experiences as a translator, a young, a young translator myself there. And uh, well, that's my presentation, which, ha which has already been made. So I'll go directly into the structure of the presentation. So I'm going to start by introducing some generalities. Uh, I've called this section Women of Courage, and you'll see why in a minute. I'm going to discuss why or how can gender-marked languages have a generic masculine. Obviously, you know the answer to that question. I do not think uh, gender-marked languages can have a generic masculine. And what is the current stages of the debate within the Francophone world in terms of the use of the generic masculine in institutional contexts? Uh, that is a con the context that I know best because uh, my research deals primarily with Quebec. Obviously, it has to deal with Anglophone Canada as well, uh, but that is where I work most. Uh, so um, then I'll go on to the Translation Bureau, Bureau de la Traduction, which is the agency on which I'm going to focus today because it is instrumental, obviously, for a, for a country with, a, uh, with bidrivalism as a legal system like Canada. Um, so uh, I will discuss how it works very briefly, and I will show um, which are the guidelines that each of the branches, the Anglophone and the Francophone branch, follow in order to uh, preserve women's rights when uh, drafting legal and institutional discourse. So that is uh, the important starting point. Uh, then that is number three, the Bureau's gender inclusive proposals. I will just uh, briefly discuss uh, what they recommend should be that should be done in these cases, as well as what they theoretically will see, theoretically implement in their own translations. And now we, I will go directly to a conclusion. I will discuss whether we are going towards a Canadian cultural dialogue, which is an, an, a statement that Sherry Simon has made. Uh, she believes that feminism has uh, enabled dialogue between the two Canadian solitudes. That's how they, that's what they call them. The two Canadian solitudes, much more than any, any patriarchal male-centered mainstream attempt in that direction. So we'll see if that really is the case or not. So we'll start with women of courage. Uh, I'm sure you know a lot of examples of women of courage who have been um, uh, unfairly treated by the perver perverse generic masculine, uh, still pervasive in our legislations today. Uh, I would indeed would like to start uh, with the example of Annie McDonald Langstaff, who was uh, an Anglophone Quebecois uh, who graduated uh, from McGill University, a lawyer, therefore, uh, who applied 
for the Bar Association and was denied access to the bar just on the grounds that the generic masculine used in the statute uh, would not allow her to be a member. She continued appealing and appealing and appealing, and this decision was always upheld until the point where they, uh, she was told different reasons. Uh, her husband had abandoned her and her child, so he couldn't grant her permission to uh, join the bar. And then she was ultimately, ultimately um, said that told that uh, she should go address the legislative branch in order to make an amendment, encourage an amendment, which she did. And in 1915, an amendment was enacted to the um, in, regarding the um, the Bar Act in Quebec, in the Quebecois Parliament, so that women for the first time would be able to become lawyers. I think that was a great step for one of the many women of courage who have brought us to where we are today. So we should ask um, Annie MacDonald Langstaff if mm, gender-marked languages can really have a generic masculine. I think the answer is clearly no. I won't, uh, I won't delve into this because it's, it's a very specific topic, but from the perspective of a Romance language, with two genders, like Spanish, like Italian, like French, there is no reason to believe that an average speaker would understand the masculine, one of the two genders, as a representative of both without there being an invisibilization of the second gender. There is no excuse. Uh, many, many arguments have gone into the direction that Latin had a third neutral gender, and therefore the masculine is somehow seen as a neutral a gender in itself. Not true. What speakers perceive is that there are two genders and that one represents both, that one stands for both permanently, and therefore there's an invisibilization of the other. That is the truth. And although pernicious in the past, the generic masculine is still majority, as we have seen in, in French institutional discourses in other legal frameworks, as we, we have already discussed throughout the day. So international institutions, in my view, should be aware of the asymmetries in the marking of gender between languages, which, by the way, as we also know, gender is not invisible in English. And the Canadian experience, as I call it here, gives me the perfect example to examine what the issues are, what is at stake when we need to build up a country from scratch with a bicultural, bilingual, um, bifold legal system, and how translation is instrumental in that. Uh, obviously, this departs from the idea that has already been said that gender is something we all have in common. Um, gender to me is intersectional because it's the basic form of difference between human beings. Um, so I think when we talk about gender in, in legislation, in institutional discourse, we're talking about much more than just rules, norms, grammar. Um, and it must be instrumental to deal with gender in order to deal also with other kinds of uh, inequality, which are obviously in, entangled with gender. So what is the current status of the debate of the generic masculine in the French, in French institutional discourse? Well, uh, our colleague Car Karine has, uh, has already explained quite a lot of what I wanted to say, so I'm going to be very brief. Uh, the Académie Française, as she probably knows, uh, issued a statement in 2017 because there had been uh, a, a textbook, I think a school textbook had been launched that had uh, a, a, an extensive use of the generic, uh, sorry, of, of inclusive language, which according to the Académie Française uh, was uh, risked to, um, to damage the reading process in younger students. So they could sort of become illiterate or something like that. Uh, because of this crazy use of the gen of inclusive forms of address to people. They even went as far as to call this use an abomination. And the French Prime Minister, Edouard Philippe, as has been already uh, discussed, decided to simply ban its institutional use following that. So um, 
in Quebec, they have always considered themselves, at, at least when I was studying there, pioneers of the francophonie in terms of the use of the gener- of different um, alternatives for inclusive writing in French. Because there is a simultaneous defense of, of language in Quebec and of women's capacity to express themselves to the side for themselves, basically the emancipation of Quebec and which is a linguistic and cultural one, and emancipation of women, as we are going to see, have gone hand in hand in the different political processes, the very, very interesting political processes taking place in the 20th century in Canada. There was uh, there are different institutions that take care of that, the Office Québécois de la Langue Française, uh, with uh, inclusive proposals, the Cercle des Femmes Parlementaires. I'm unable to explain because I have asked them and I, I didn't get a coherent answer what exactly they do in order to preserve uh, women's rights in uh, legal drafting at the Québécois Parliament. But apparently that is one of their explicit tasks on the Parliament, on the Parliament's website. So, Let's go directly to the Bureau de la Traduction uh, Translation Bureau. Important things. Historical milestones. It was funded in 1934. Previously, there existed different agencies. They were merged into one official institutional aid agency under this bifold name. Um, in 1969, with the Official Languages Act and the Trudeau era, um, new translation translation programs were implemented. So um, translation became essential for coexistence in Canada, institutional and legal coexistence in Canada. In 1982, there was the patriation of the constitution, the Canadian constitution. It was no more, uh, it was uh, no more dependent on Westminster uh, for uh, the implementation and enforcement of different uh, amendments. So that was important because a series of negotiations started precisely at that point. Uh, not very successful uh, when Quebec was concerned. Quebec uh, did not agree to most of what was proposed in terms of amendments. And so there, most of most constitutional texts do not have a French version, which is quite worrying and quite problematic, as you all may imagine. So there were different accords that failed um, in order to amend the constitution. And no French versions exist of many of the texts uh, worked on at the time. Structure, autonomous constellations of working units. Sometimes the work is externalized with private practitioners when there is just too much to cope with. And there is independence, very important, between the Anglophone and the Francophone branch. Peculiarities, the centralized decision-making regime and their linguistic and cultural policies are also independent in terms of Anglophone and Francophone work. So in the Francophone case, they coordinate with the Office de Québec de Langue Française, but also with other institutions. Let's see, particularly, what the Bureau de la Traduction, in this case, the Francophone branch, proposes as uh, gender-inclusive strategies. Here we have um, some terms that I have extracted that I found in the Guide du Redacteur, which is the basic uh, handbook that they use not only to translate themselves, but also as... um, as a user-friendly set of suggestions for the population to use. So uh, we have different terms here that I would like to point out, uh, I would like to underscore, because they are highly technical, first of all, I think, not very user-friendly, and sometimes very confusing. What are we doing here? We start with the word feminisation which is a very marked word in my view. I understand feminisation as a reversal, a reversal of the generic, generic masculine, a sort of retaliating, not retaliating, but you understand what I mean, reversing strategy. Marking the presence of women's, women in words, texts or communications, reflecting their position in society and marking, making them more visible. This definition is not very clear. 
Feminization lexical, more specific. Lexical feminization refers to the feminine transposition of masculine nouns, specific, like especially when talking about professions and denominations. Um, we found this doublet traducteur, traductrice, tout et tout. Rédaction épicène. I, I, this is where my mind blows with due respect, because I don't know how rédaction épicène and feminisation linguistique can be part of the same thing. Um, rédaction non sexiste, feminisation des textes. Apparently, these terms are interchangeable. Gender neutral language, gender inclusive language, non sexist language, non sexist writing. These translations I have provided myself in the best of my ability because I don't really know what the terms entail. So, kind of writing aiming to avoid the use of the generic masculine and prioritize neutral terms to personalizing the text and syntactic feminization using full doublets. Tout employé ou tout employé qui demande, quiconque demande, that has been already discussed. So potentially contentious aspects of these terminology. Feminization or parity, what are we talking about? Reversing, um, replacing, going to the very extreme of things or equalizing. This is the thing. The Bureau de la Traduction basically, most of the time, it is not very coherent, but talks about femini feminizing language. The Université du Québec à Montréal, who, uh, which has also prepared a very, very interesting set of guidelines, talks about equalizing. And Lamotte, for example, one very well-known author um, dealing with this kind of issues in France, talks about desexualizing. I think these three things are used in interchangeable ways. And that is very, very, very um, confusing. Then we have the extreme of all extremes, which is the generic feminine composed only or mainly by women when this this reminds me of what Dr. Mar Marades has been talk, talking about. This is usually uh, advised only when we have a, a group of people who are mainly women because it's used as a retaliating strategy to centuries of patriarchal abuse. It's not recommended. It's not a matter of revenge, okay? So many people would... Uh, just say, okay, let's use the generic feminine as we have been using the generic masculine to refer to all humankind. Um, so that is an extreme position, obviously, that no one recommends so directly. So let's see now what the Bureau de la Traduction does when given the chance to work on texts. This, um, this abortion act was abrogated very, uh, not very not a long time ago, but when I published the article, the, the paper in, on which this um, this presentation is based, um, it was it was still in force. So um, I have just used it because it is very convenient. It illustrates most of the, the problems I see. You see here that some neutral terms like quiconque, um, la personne qui rend le service sexuel are quite okay, accurate. Cette personne, toute personne. Okay, but then we see il, 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 il. Hey, 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 hey. Les personnes suivantes. Very well. Un médecin qualifié. I mean, Quebec has been issuing official reports on the feminization of professions, of, of names of professions since the mid 70s. Many, many official reports on that. It is clearly, it has been a pioneer of inclusive language within the Francophonie. But then, 2017, this was last updated, I think, in 2017, then abrogated in 2019. En médecin qualifié. Then we have, interestingly enough, when they refer to the pregnant person, they are quite considerate 
have quite a lot of regard for non-binary people because they talk about une personne du sexe féminin qui est en enceinte, that is, a person of the female sex who being pregnant, it's interesting. I think they are trying to avoid binary conceptions of gender as opposed to sex. But, um, yeah, so they have regard for that, but then they keep the il and they keep the médecin masculine. Médecin qualifié. Okay. Very briefly, let's see what they do in English. Translation Bureau. You'll see that the structure of the guidelines has nothing to do. It is much more practical, much more straight to the point as you would expect of Anglo-Saxon mentalities. Um, less theoretical, more practical. Elimination of stereotyping in written communications. That's chapter 14 of the so-called Canadian style guide. This has been enforced since uh, an official report was launched in, issued in 1982. And they talk about different things that we have already discussed, elimination of sexual stereotyping, parallel treatment, use of pronouns, personification. Obviously, uh, we're talking about uh, natural disasters. There is a tendency to use the feminine, which is, mm, there's no reason for that. Titles of occupation. Okay, careful use of words like man, lady, girl, woman were not needed. Then they say elimination of sexual stereotyping, full range of human characteristics and situation. This is where the intersectionality, in my view, is considered. Gender plus other kinds of um, stereotyping. Then the rest of the um, of the rest of the the, the 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 suggestions I haven't given any examples because I just wanted to comment on very briefly. They were not related to gender. These other um, uh, uh, suggestions were uh, connected to different kinds of stereotyping that have nothing to do with gender. They have to do with race, with um, with um, disabilities and other aspects of, of social life. But there's no way to connect gender with other kinds of stereotyping when gender very, very often goes with other forms of discrimination hand in hand in institutional discourse. This I find um, mind-blowing. But anyway... Right, right. As you can see, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but please go to the end. We are almost at uh, yeah, that's uh, 15, yeah, 16. 15. It's the conclusion. No, I'm done. Thank you. Um, so, a step towards the Canadian cultural dialogue. That is the question that I posed at the beginning. It has been said that feminism in um, in Canada has been a bridge between the two solitudes, Anglophone Canada and Francophone Canada. And I basically agree with that. I think that institutional, mainstream institutional attempts at using translation in order to create this coherence between two almost irreconcilable uh, projects has failed. And I think feminists in more cultural, less institutional spaces have been able to have dialogue. But I still see, nevertheless, and I have published this somewhere else, that um, institutional discourse, both in Quebec and in Anglophone Canada, has been used, exploited, in order to create an, um, an image of modernity, consolidate the image, for example, that Canada has of tolerance, of equality, especially in regard with the US, which is typically the more neoliberal, less fair, and, and let's more violent neighbor. And then Quebec has, from being a, a very, very rural and perhaps not very modern province, from granting women the right to vote in 1940, almost 30 years after the other, the other provinces, it, it suddenly started a quiet revolution. 
it started to do things, to change things. And nationalism was born at the time. And nationalism saw it fit to take advantage of feminism as a, as a driving force. It took advantage of feminism, in my view, and in the view of many experts in political science in Quebec. So uh, I think there is an exploitation of gender issues and equality, gender equality, in institutional discourse in both countries, uh, which I cannot uh, delve into right now. But I will, uh, if there is a, an, another occasion, I will definitely delve into. And that is the reason, perhaps, why there is no, because we have not a real institutional dialogue, at least at a mainstream level, that is in, institu in official institutions, between these two solitudes, Quebec and Anglophone Canada, the linguistic remarks that we find in their guidelines for translation, for the translation of something as sensitive as, for example, legislation on abortion, are completely uh, disconnected from each other. So there is no consideration of the symmetries that are produced in these contexts. And I think the Canadian experience as such is a great example that should be further explored to detect the kind of issues that arise when drafting legislation in terms of gender. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helena, for Thank you. this a very interesting uh, uh, talk. I'm sure that in particular, Karine uh, uh, will address uh, questions to your talk. And uh, yes, let's move on with the last speaker and the questions and comments at the end. The last speaker of this very, very dense uh, afternoon session, and uh, she is uh, Alba Soriano Hernandez. Alba uh, is a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Administrative Law uh, at the University of Valencia where she also obtained a PhD in law for her dissertation on current and future possibilities for the regulation of algorithm discrimination. Her research currently focuses on public employment and automated decision-making and its impact on fundamental rights. Uh, the title of her talk uh, uh, is Artificial Intelligence, Gender and Language. The growing computational capacity of, of automated decision-making tools has led to their widespread using all types of processes. However, this increase in efficiency does not come without its issues. Of the last, past decade, a rather worrying amount of cases in which algorithms helped to perpetuate certain historical structures if discrimination have been brought forward. In this context, it is particularly relevant to point out how these systems can, uh, can and do reproduce certain sexist and stereotypes in the way the systems process language and human voices. This work is close, the causes and aims to offer some solution to this issue. Thank you, Elena, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to, to thank Dr. Julia Panisi for inviting me uh, to join um, this, this workshop and Professor Ana Mar Marrades because it is thanks to her um, contact that I was able to join uh, this and participate in this workshop. So the, the topic um, I'm, I'm going to focus on is the use of artificial intelligence or automated decision making um, and how these systems process language and uh, yield outputs that help to perpetuate structures of discrimination. So uh, first of all, uh, when, when I refer to automated decision-making or, alg or algorithmic systems, algorithmic decision-making systems, I refer to computer programs, to software tools that are used uh, in contexts, for example, in, in translation uh, of text. So uh, the Google Translate app is an example of an automated system. 
Um, but I also refer to um, applications to software programs that are used in, in other contexts that uh, directly and very significantly impact the, the lives of individuals. So, for example, uh, nowadays, most banks use these types of tools in order to determine whether a person should obtain a loan that they have applied for, um, and if so, under which conditions. Um, and so the problem is that over the past few years, the growing complexity of these systems and their growing efficiency has led to their use in a, in a very wide number of contexts, both by public and private organizations. Um, and also these uh, growing use of automated decision making systems has come um, alongside uh, 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 the realization that they help to perpetuate certain historical structures of inequality that, um, that uh, harm the members of historically disadvantaged groups. So these systems are trained uh, by using real world data. Uh, and since we live, we live in a society that is built upon structures of discrimination, um, the, these systems learn uh, these structures and learn to discriminate or learn to, to show, to convey stereotypes, to yield st negative stereotypes that uh, affect the members of historically disadvantaged groups. In addition, it is also important to take into consideration that most of the people that are working in big tech companies, which as I will now move on to explain, are the, the companies that mainly develop these systems. And well, in general, most computer programmers, pro programmers in fact, are um, white males, um, white heterosexual males that are generally, uh, generally come from rather affluent backgrounds. Um, these are people that uh, have a series of biases that are further reinforced by their working environment and which they uh, inadvertently and sometimes even consciously end up embedding in these systems. So um, why is automated decision making important when it comes to or what is its relation uh, with legislative drafting? Um, so what I uh, contended when in my in my thesis and and throughout uh, the, the conclusion I reached when when carrying out my research was that um, the power that these uh, that the that these systems currently have um, means that they effectively operate as regulatory instruments both when used by the private sector and the public sector. Um, so obviously the case is more difficult to make when, when it comes to, to, to the use of these systems by the private sector. But basically the main companies that are developing automated decision-making systems operate, um, effectively operate as monopolies. Um, they operate, uh, cyber spaces that are essential in the lives of almost everyone, especially in the Western world. Um, it is uh, impossible, uh, in fact, to, to not use uh, the systems generated by these companies. Um, so uh, the, the, there is no real choice. Um, and these, these companies create a series of choice architectures that lead uh, individuals uh, to behave in certain ways, uh, which means that, that these, uh, these companies are effectively regulating the cyberspaces they operate. And in addition to all of these, over the past few years, the, um, the uh, public institutions, for example, uh, the EU, have tried to create um, uh, legislative frameworks in order to control these companies. However, in order to do so, they have had to create core regulatory regimes, which entails, uh, which means that these companies, that public institutions require the cooperation of these companies in order to make uh, these legislative tools effective. So the power that they have, uh, for example, when it comes to making the right to be forgotten that is recognized in the GDPR effective, um, the power that these companies Companies have is even larger. Um, when it comes to the public sector, um, automated systems are also being used in uh, uh, a series of contexts that have very significant impacts on the lives of individuals. 
Um, so uh, over the past few years, some public institutions have tried to argue that uh, the software tools that they use uh, in decision-making processes are no more than uh, simple uh, aid, uh, simple aids uh, to the decision that is finally made by a human. However, in many cases, it has been detected that the final decision is in fact made by the algorithm or that even when it is not the algorithm, the, the system that makes the final decision, the individuals uh, that make the final decision are very heavily influenced by the system's output. So um, what I'm going to explain are a few cases of the way in which uh, automated systems uh, process, can process language, and how the way in which they process language leads uh, to discriminatory outputs or the perpetuation of structures of inequality in general. Um, so I'm not going to focus per se on um, gender neutral language, et cetera, but on the way in which language helps to, for example, perpetuate certain gender uh, certain gender stereotypes, or on the way in which these systems are able to capture features that, although apparently neutral, in fact result in cases of indirect discrimination towards women. So the first examples uh, I want uh, to refer to are those in which uh, the use of language uh, by these systems is very obvious. So I, I referred uh, before to, to the use of, of translation apps. Um, so here's the example of Google's translation app, which when translating from Hungarian to English, um, uh, helps to perpetuate certain gender roles associated to professions. So Hungarian is a gender neutral language, um, which uh, uh, doesn't use feminine or masculine pronouns. However, when uh, these, when certain professions are translated to English, the system automatically, um, in most cases, uh, translates it, uh, translates each profession uh, with a female or male, uh, male pro pronoun, depending on whether that profession is associated to, that profession is associated to its exercise by men or women. The second example I wanted uh, to refer to is uh, the use of uh, text analysis systems. So, for example, Google's natural language processing sentiment analysis system um, has now been fixed. But initially, um, what it did, so this system, what it does is uh, you, you can introduce uh, sentences into it or phrases. And the, the system um, outputs a series of, of conclusions it reaches regarding that sentence. Um, and one of the, of the elements it considers is whether the phrase introduced has positive or negative connotations. So if the phrase, I'm a homosexual, was introduced, the system gave it a negative score. Um, the same happened when the phrase, I'm black or I'm a Jew, were introduced. However, when phrases such as, I'm a heterosexual, were introduced, a positive score was yielded by the system. Um, another case in, in, in which uh, the use of language uh, is, is significant when, when it comes to these systems is uh, the, uh, the results that uh, search platforms, uh, in, in particular, obviously, Google, because it's the main search engine that we use, um, the way in which certain combinations of words uh, yield to different outputs that help to perpetuate historical structures of discrimination. So uh, in, in the UN Women's Autocomplete Truth Campaign of 2013, what they proved is that uh, when uh, certain combinations of words, including the word women, were introduced into the search box, the suggestions uh, reveal certain negative sentiments towards women um, or certain negative stereotypes referring to women. And in addition, when, when other combinations of words are, are introduced into the platform, now this is something that Google has been working on, but um, there's still a long way to go. Uh, generally, when, uh, when, when, the, when the search refers to women, especially racialized women, uh, the results in many cases, uh, the results that are yielded in many cases refer to to suggestions that refer to the sexualization of women, to the objectification of women, and so on. 
Um, also, although this doesn't have that much to do with the actual analysis of language, uh, I think it's also important to, to take into consideration the, the role that voice recognition systems play. So, for example, um, voice recognition systems still generally are, are trained in many cases from a very androcentric perspective and have trouble identifying female and understanding female voices. Um, and there's also the fact that most uh, voice systems are women, uh, are, uh, are use female voices, um, which uh, then again uh, helps to 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 convey uh, to reinforce the idea uh, of women as uh, as uh, servient beings, as secretaries, as caretakers, and so on. So up until now, I've mostly referred to the actual analysis of language, well, except for the voice recognition systems. Um, but there are also cases um, in which, in fact, most cases uh, when automated decision making systems are used, uh, these systems uh, analyze language um, and yield results based on the words they analyze. So uh, targeting uh, uh, targeting ad systems, so the, sy the automated systems that are used in order to target advertisements, um, use to create profiles and based on said profiles of individuals, target advertisements to those who to those individuals which they consider um, that identify with the profile with the demographic population that they should be targeting. Um, so, uh, for example, Facebook is capable of uh, generating profiles on, on each of its users, uh, which identify uh, their membership to disadvantaged groups. Um, and based on, on, this, on these profiles, they can target advertisements. So, for example, um, uh, Facebook is, able, uh, is capable of identifying whether an individual is a member of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and un up until very recently, uh, many, uh, many people uh, pertaining to, to the LGBT plus, uh, LGBTQ plus community were targeted, were being targeted by uh, conversion therapy advertisements uh, based on the, on the use of, of, the pro of, the, of the words homosexual or LGBTQ acronym. Um, these profiles are built on the actions that are, are, are carried out by these individuals within the platform. Um, in addition, uh, targeted advertising is also used in order to carry out predatory practices. So, for example, combinations of words are used in order to detect uh, individuals, in particular women, which are in vulnerable positions. Um, so some of the combinations of words that are used by these systems are uh, such as are combinations of words such as um, divorced women or struggling women, um, economically struggling women and so on, in order to identify possible victims or possible clients rather, but um, of uh, in particular uh, toxic financial products. Right. Um, in addition, uh, the, these uh, targeting systems can also be used in order to exclude certain users of uh, digital platforms uh, from being uh, shown certain advertisements. So um, Facebook, for example, which is which is the, the, the case that I'm mostly referring to, um, May, as it uses profiles that identify an individual's membership to a certain racial group, let advertisers exclude users by race. And even the platform on its own, in some cases, for example, regarding housing ads, um, excludes uh, members of uh, minority populations for, from certain housing advertisements. Um, and, uh, and, and in, in addition, when it comes to advertisement regard, regarding uh, jobs, uh, it also tends to target ads um, uh, depending on whether a job uh, is more associated to its exercise by women or men. So the population it targets um, will be women or men, mainly, depending uh, on whether that type of position. So, for example, if it's an engineering position, most of the individuals targeted by that ad will be men. Um, finally, the, the, the last examples I wanted to refer to are uh, applications that, uh, that have direct effect or that ha have a direct effect on individuals' life, a more direct effect. 
uh, which are tools that are used in recruitment processes. Um, so, for example, a few years ago, Amazon started developing uh, uh, an, an algorithm that it eventually it eventually discarded. Uh, because it was never uh, the 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 tech experts at Amazon were never able to fix it, um, which and this algorithm, what it did is it was trained. Uh, it was designed to to hire to select the CVs of of job applicants that could be um, that could be adequate to occupy a position in the company. Um, so what the system the system was trained on the CVs uh, that uh, of job applicants. Uh, over the the previous ten years, and on those people that had been hired. So, since most of the people that work in the tech sector, as I mentioned earlier on, are men, the system learned to detect which CVs belong to uh, female candidates. So, the system was in theory gender neutral. It, it was gender blind. Sorry. So, the system um, in theory was not able to access information on an individual's uh, gender and an individual on, on each of the applicant sex. Um, however, it learned to identify certain certain words that were common to female applicant CVs. Um, and based on the detection of, of these common, of these common words, um, it, uh, eliminated those CVs that it detected to, uh, belong to women. In addition, uh, when these systems are, are programmed, uh, when these systems are created, uh, programmers have to select the features that are relevant in order to predict the, the social phenomenon that the, that the, that the algorithm is set out to measure. So, for example, if we're talking about uh, a system that is designed to, to be used in recruitment processes, um, a programmer might uh, decide uh, or the company might decide that leadership is a quality that should be searched for in, in candidates. Um, the problem here is, or for example, when, when these systems are also used for promotions, the problem here is that, uh, when these types of words are used, uh, they, um, they, for example, when using words such as leadership, leadership is a word that is generally associated to, to men. However, when women display similar attitudes, um, they will be described as, uh, bossy, as aggressive, and so on. Consequently, the use of, uh, the, of these features, so the, the feature selection process within, uh, within the, the programming of the algorithm can, uh, in many cases lead to the perpetuation of these structures of inequality. So, uh, as a short conclusion, um, the, the way forward should be, um, making uh, programmers in particular, well, diversifying the, the tech workforce, uh, first of all, um, and making programmers aware of the risks that, they, that AI systems entail um, in order to create uh, gender-aware uh, AI systems, uh, uh, gender-aware automated systems that are able to detect those variables that are proxies for being a woman and to avoid that a lower score, for example, is applied to those variables, um, and to introduce the notion of equality by design in these systems, because currently most of the individuals of the people that are, are programming these systems um, are not uh, using equality by design techniques. They are not... Sorry, Alba, the last yes. minute. Yes, no, I'm, I'm all done. So this is the conclusion. So, um, yes. And also, uh, I think it's also really important to recognize the regulatory power of artificial intelligence systems. Um, and based on this idea, set oversight mechanisms that are effective, not just for the public sector, but also for those private sector companies that are becoming um, so powerful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alva. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, well, <laughs> lots of people thought, actually, and uh, really interesting uh, uh, as well, your presentation, Alda, really, really interesting. And uh, 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 this is a very uh, uh, shocking way in which the artificial intelligence automated, actually, uh, uh, language reproduces, of course, uh, uh, the... Referential and social agenda 
that uh, uh, we have in language. By the way, uh, this language put uh, in artificial intelligence is made by, by man <laughs> uh, and uh, by human beings. And actually it resembles uh, 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 stereotypes uh, and uh, inequalities that we have uh, in, uh, in language. I mean, uh, uh, we actually there is uh, plenty to say about all these issues faced today. And uh, I'm so happy uh, that you enjoyed uh, uh, the, the talk. And the, I mean, the presentation was simply successful. Lots of things to talk about. And of course, this proved that the topic of gender, uh, language, and law is a, a, a really important one. And uh, we really, really hope, actually, uh, we as organizers, uh, as uh, scholars, we hope that the questions raised today and the answers that we try to, to, to provide, um, uh, and we try to provide in the future will definitely affect the quality of uh, uh, legislative drafting, law, and maybe language in our own experience. So thank you all. Uh, I would like to give you a huge talk. Thank you so much. And of course, we will keep in touch. And uh, uh, hopefully uh, next year, we will be able to uh, uh, organize another, another uh, really interesting uh, workshop, maybe in presence. But by the way, uh, we will be informed well in advance. By the way, I wish you the best. Uh, please keep in touch and uh, good luck for everything. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.